diamonds glassy. Yeah. Work. Black Bugatti. pleasure for us to welcome you here uh, at today's conference on diversity in science and technology. Warm welcome here in Bern. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, we all enjoy diversity in our lives. When we talk about culture, for example, uh, we like to have a choice. We go to movies, theaters, we go to the opera, right? We want to have a choice. When we go to restaurants, it's the same thing. We want to have a diverse offering. We are in Bern, so our political system nearby works properly because we have uh, a plurality of parties representing the whole population. So we all know that diversity is essential. Yet in many areas, diversity is a scarce resource. The percentage of women in our cantonal government is around 30% only. In our Swiss uh, Council of States, just a few hundred meters away, we only have 26% of women. In boardrooms across Switzerland, 24%. So there we have a lot of work to do. And worst of all, in science and technology, diversity is also a major issue. Our top schools, EPFL, ETH Zurich, are pushing hard to increase the number of female students, currently at about 30%. And more than ever, the world needs science to solve our biggest challenges. Think about global warming, for instance. And science needs women. At CSEM, we feel that it is very important to have a forum to exchange on how we can improve the situation. We wanted to provide an exchange platform for outstanding individuals who are working to advance the status of women uh, in science, technology, engineering and mathematics, so-called STEMs. And this is why we organize this event. Providing such a platform uh, for women in technology is crucial for the emergence of female role models. Role models like Jocelyn uh, Bell Bernal that we will hear soon. They will encourage more and more women uh, to follow in their footsteps. We want to bring our contribution to building a world of diversity and inclusion. Because science and technology needs women, as just said. Well, some of you may ask, well, why does it matter, really? And as a father of two girls, 17 and 19 years old, I want them to have the same opportunities as boys their age. I want them to have the same probability of survival in case of a car crash. But yet today, as we know, crash test dummies are built and designed based on the men average. Uh, one example of designs that forgets about women and puts their lives at risk. I want my girls to have the same chances of recovery in case they suffer from an illness. And yet we know that women are underrepresented in clinical studies with only about 35% of female participants. I want them to, make, uh, to take the right amount of painkillers when they have a headache. And yet today they are taking medications whose doses have been designed and set with men in mind. And I want them to be safe and equally treated in the digital world. And yet today, only 22% of professionals in AI, in artificial intelligence, are women. As a CEO of CSCM, I want to have access to the brightest minds. And yet the percentage of resumes we receive from female applicants is systematically below 20%. And this cannot be. So our critical access to qualified resources is a critical success factor for any company. We need to tap into the potential 
of talented women. And it's especially important uh, knowing that by 2027, we will need over 36,000 information and communication specialists. And I want that the products that we design at CSCM with our customers serve both men and women equally. And to reach this goal, we need more diversity in our engineering teams. But believe me, it's a challenge to find the right candidates. I remain hopeful, however. Real progress is happening, change is, in the, is underway. And this is due in part because a positive link between a company's financial performance and its diversity has now been demonstrated. I like this quote from Rita Le well, not this one. <laughs> this quote from Rita Levi Montalcini, an Italian Nobel laureate honored for her work in neurobiology. And she said that young women can now look toward a future modeled by their own hands. And I think this is nowadays uh, true. Young women today have many, many options to choose from. They are offered support through dedicated coaching programs. CSCM has always cared for diversity. In 2003, we were the first company in the state of Neuchâtel to have its own daycare. Four years later, CSCM was the first Swiss company to obtain the Equal Salary Certification. And since years, the company has been pushing part-time work for both men and women uh, at CSCM. In 2021, we have accelerated the pace with a clear development plan around diversity, including non-discrimination and promotion of diversity in our hiring proce pro process. And this was in big part thanks to the brilliant work of our colleagues, some of them here from the HR department and from the engineering teams, who are pushing because they want to see that something is happening. We trained all employees on gender biases, starting with the executive management team. And we're working on stereotypes at all levels, and believe me, there is still a lot of work to do. Our recruitment process takes now into consideration our goal, which is to have more female representation. We defined our gender equality plan and many other initiatives. For example, mentorship. We promoted mentorship because stereotypes, again, can be changed by exposing women to other successful women. Today, I want to say to all women that are early in their career, please dare. Don't doubt about your skills. Even if you don't have them, just do as men do. Pretend that you have them, pretend you know, and dare. Hard skills can be acquired, but soft skills are much more difficult to learn. And women usually are exceptional in soft skills. So don't undervalue yourself and follow your dreams. And if you have daughters like me, tell them that everything is possible and they can really change the world and we badly need them to do so. We have also launched many small initiatives to increase awareness on diversity, like you see here our colleagues participating to the uh, Frauenlauf in Basel a few weeks back. It was a good time for them to share a good experience, uh, get support and share through actions. We recently organized also an event with SATV, the Swiss Academy of Engineering Sciences, to promote digital jobs that are uh, badly needed now for, uh, and available for boys and girls. And we know that helping young girls, parents and teachers to deconstruct stereotypes is important to open our minds and to move forward on this journey. And soon in November, uh, we will be participating to a female hackathon in Zurich. So as mentioned earlier, more than ever, the world needs science to tackle our major problems. And science badly needs women. So let's listen to a great scientist and role model, Jocelyn Bell Bernal, and see what she and our other uh, guest speakers in the panel have to say about women, science, and diversity. Thanks a lot for coming here, despite the uh, COVID situation. We appreciate having you here and hope you enjoy the event. Thank you very much. And now, 
And then I'll Thank give you. the word no, I can, I to can Nathalie Di Coma. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alexandre Fauchard. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Nathalie Di Coma. I'm uh, going to be the moderator this afternoon, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here and to lead you through this CSEM uh, event, not only because Gender diversity, inclusion are issues that are so important, challenging, uh, um, interesting. Sometimes you feel it's painful, hard, that change is difficult. But I mean, it is changing. And at each step of the change, we need to remind ourselves, OK, what can be done to go towards diversity? And why does it matter? So we're going to try and an answer all these questions this afternoon. And I'm also delighted because the people uh, you're going to uh, meet, listen to, share their experiences are absolutely outstanding, brilliant people, women for most of them. And I'm very happy to uh, be with them this afternoon. Uh, you will also have your word to say this afternoon because we've got that fantastic tool called Slido, I think. Yes, Slido. I think there's a QR, QR code that should appear and that you can scan from where you are. That will give you access to that application uh, to allow you to uh, put through your comments and questions. We'll put them through to our guests. We'll have two uh, little Q&A sessions at the end of our, of our first uh, key speaker speech and at the end of the afternoon when we'll have the big round table panel with all our guests and then again you'll be invited to put your questions on the table. So uh, we're not, we can't guarantee we can select all the questions but it's worth giving it a try. So just do that. Okay, cut it short Natalie because I know you're as impatient as I am uh, to listen to our first guest. Uh, she is just one of the most important astronomers in science history. That's absolutely huge. World famous for her discovery of pulsars. That was back in 1967 when she was uh, completing her PhD in Cambridge. She has had uh, an outstanding career since she still has an outstanding career and she's uh, been serving in many prominent roles president first female president of the institute of physics of the uk uh, president of the royal astronomical society and so on she is also the recipient of countless honors and awards she is a passionate generous person and advocate to uh, uh, off underrepresented groups within the STEM field. She has recently donated uh, almost three million Swiss francs that she won from the very prestigious uh, Breakthrough Prize uh, to fund a PhD scholarships for underrepresented physics students in the UK. So that tells us how uh, much she is dedicated to, in, uh, to promoting diversity. Um, that is outstanding, really. It's a pleasure and it's a great, great honor to welcome on stage Professor Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Thank you very much, Natalie. Thank you very much. I think the microphone is working. Yeah, thank you. Right. So, gender diversity in astronomy. I'm not going wider than astronomy, but you may well see parallels with where you are. I've been asked to say a bit about the discovery of pulsars, and I'm also going to say a bit about women in astronomy today worldwide. So radio astronomy, the detection of radio waves from stars, galaxies, things in outer space. This is one of the big radio telescopes in Britain at Jodrell Bank. It has recently been given world heritage status. So the university has to keep it standing, which I think will be expensive. <laughs> so this was one of the first big radio telescopes in the world and set the pace for the field. Radio astronomy was developed by people who, during the Second World War, the radar experts, at the end of the war, if they were on the winning side, acquired some radar equipment and took it back to their universities. They were particularly interested in the receiving equipment, not the transmitting and they turned these receiving antennae to the sky and found that there were a lot of objects 
giving radio signals. So let's say there's one there. And they would go to their optical colleagues and say, what is there at that point in the sky? And the optical astronomers would say, well, there's a thing that looks a bit like a star, but it's not any kind of star that we've ever noticed before. So these things became known as quasi-stellar radio sources. There was a breakthrough when uh, Martin Schmidt from the Netherlands and Jesse Greenstein, working in Caltech, realized that the spectrum of these curious stars could be explained if they were given a large shift to red wavelengths. It was hydrogen, red shifted. Now, red shift means motion away from you, and large red shift means large motion away from you. And we know we live in an expanding universe, and the further out we go, the faster the expansion. Because actually, we're going back in time. The signals that we pick up from further away have been longer on the journey to us. So the further out we go, we're seeing things earlier in the life of the universe. So we're seeing back quite a long way in the life of the universe, and these things have a large redshift. So yes, OK, they're from earlier in the universe, and they're very distant. But if they're very distant, how the heck can they be so bright? But they are so bright. And this was the puzzle about quasars, quasi-stellar radio sources. We now know, incidentally, that they contain a massive black hole, like here, and often out of the black hole there are a couple of jets. That's typically what a quasar looks like closer up. So stopping the astronomy there for a moment or two to explain my background, because I think some of that's quite relevant. Um, this is a map of the British Isles. I started life here in the north of Ireland. I had some of my secondary schooling in the north of England, in York. I did my first degree at the University of Glasgow. And you can see that these all lie in the more mountainous and less affluent part of the United Kingdom. I then, rather by accident, ended up in Cambridge. Cambridge is in the south of England, the rich, posh, civilized part of the country. <laughs> I don't know if you have any gradients like that here. I would think that would be very un-Swiss. But as perceived from the south of England, the south of England is ultimate civilization, and everything else is savages. <laughs> so I had come from savage country to this very, very proper place. And I now realize I suffered what we call imposter syndrome. I don't know how much this is an issue here, whether it's recognized here. Um, somebody comes to a place like University of Cambridge or University of Oxford, where I now work, and they are overwhelmed, usually by the young men who are terribly confident and absolutely sure they have a right to be there whether they do any work or not. And this poor person, oh, they're all very bright. I'm not so clever. They made a mistake admitting me. They're going to discover their mistake and throw me out. And this is still an issue in Oxford, Cambridge. And at this time of year, well, slightly earlier in the year, we are watching the new students very carefully to make sure that they do not say, ah, I must go away home. Because if we do not watch within a week, the student will have gone home. And it now has a name, it is imposter syndrome. Well, we didn't identify it, we didn't name it when I was a graduate student, but with hindsight, I can see that's exactly what I was suffering from. But I'd had quite a fight to get there. And I wasn't just going to run away. I knew they'd made a mistake. 
I knew they would discover their mistake, and sooner or later they would throw me out. But until then, I was going to do my very, very best work, work very, very hard, so that when they threw me out, I'd know I'd done my best, and I would have a clear conscience. I just was not bright enough for Cambridge. So I'm working very hard. Discomfort increased in the first week. The new students in radio astronomy got given a set of tools. These are my tools. They are not microelectronics tools. They're full-size, heavy-duty, wire-working tools. Because I'm going to spend quite a lot of time wire-working. The project I joined was to find more of these mysterious quasars, the very distant, very bright radio sources. There were about 20 known. That's not a big enough sample. We needed to find more. And I won't go into the technical details, but it involved repeated mapping of the sky and looking for things that fluctuated in brightness, and those would be the quasars. And indeed, the technique worked a treat. I got the number of quasars up from 20 to about 200. So that was very satisfactory. We spent two years building the radio telescope, and then the rest of my colleagues melted onto other projects. And I was left on my own to get the telescope working, which it did first time, yeah, and then to make the observations and analyze the data. So this is some of the construction phase. It was literally working in the field. Um, that's me, inadequately wrapped up against the cold, and my technician, Don. And for those who are interested in it, this is low-loss cable, HM4, which you cannot coil up. It has a very, you need a large radius of curvature. We could not take it inside. So to put the plugs and sockets on the end, I worked in this little hut. And there's another one down there somewhere. And here we are checking the impedance, checking that I've put all the plugs and sockets on properly and they're making contact. Um, this is a, a slotted waveguide. So my responsibility for the radio telescope was all the cables and plugs and connectors and transformers and, and that kind of stuff. Um, it was a very big radio telescope, area equivalent to 57 tennis courts. This is what it looked like. Um, really a rather simple design. Uh, think of it as 2000 early style television, and television aerials, antennae connected together. So there were about 2000 antennae. About 1000 wooden posts. The wooden posts are the most obvious thing. They're only to keep it all out of the wet grass. Because wet grass is an electrical short. And if wet grass touches the bare wires, the signal goes down there. So it was nearly 200 kilometers of wire and cable in that. And then when it was constructed, the others melted away, and I was left to get it working and make the observations. At that time, University of Cambridge had one computer. It had less memory than your laptop. And it took up a whole room because it was made with what we call valves, vacuum tubes. Transistors were only just coming in. So transistors were very rare. And that computer with memory like your laptop could only be used by a few people. We did not have time on it. Our data came out on rolls and rolls of paper chart. And by the end of the project, I had five kilometers of this paper. I got used to identifying the quasars, which I was meant to be observing. I also got used to identifying radio interference. In those days, cars were badly suppressed. If a car along the local road, my parents because of the spark plugs. Um, taxi radios, if they'd been allocated our frequency. 
anything that sparked, arc welders and so on. So I got used to interference. And here's a small piece of the chart recorder. There's some interference. And this was the first sighting of the signal that turned out to be the pulsar. And the first few times I saw it, I knew it wasn't a quasar. I knew it wasn't interference. I log it with a question mark. The human brain has amazing memory because after going through a few of these charts and occasionally spotting this funny signal, my brain said, you've seen this before, haven't you? You've seen this before from this bit of sky, haven't you? And then it's easy because I have all the old charts rolled up, stored in shoeboxes, and they're labeled by which strip of the sky, which latitude on the sky. And you pull out the chart that covers this particular, lat the box that covers this particular latitude, lay out the charts. This platform would be excellent for laying out charts. <laughs> Line them up. So here's this one. Wasn't there last time, no the time before. Might have been there before that. And it was there before that, but not there, not there, maybe. I noted that one. They all line up. It's coming from the same bit of sky. So at this point, I go to my thesis advisor who says, yeah, great. This occupies about five millimeters. Can't see what it is. We need an enlargement. With this technology, paper chart, to get an enlargement, you run the paper faster under the pen and everything gets spread out. But you can't leave it running faster all the time because it gets through the whole roll of paper in 20 minutes. And guess who lives at the observatory putting a fresh roll of paper in every 20 minutes? No. The grad student goes out to the observatory at about this time, switches to the high speed, lets it run to about there, switches off. And I did that for weeks, and it had gone. And my thesis advisor said, oh, it's your fault. It's been and gone and done it, and you've missed it. Anybody who is or has been a grad student will know it's always the grad student's fault. <laughs> always. Then finally, one day, I got it. So along the bottom are one-second time marks, and here's the signal. And you can see along here, it's equally spaced, about one and a third seconds. There's one missing there, but those are on phase. Might be, might be missing, yep, yep. And similarly here, a few missing, beep, beep, beep. So the amplitude's quite variable, but the period seems quite constant. Um, this was added afterwards. LGM stands for Little Green Men. But you know it's added afterwards because you don't call the first one number one until you've got more than one, and then you go back and number the first one number one. So that's a later addition by my thesis advisor. So we had to go through all the usual tests. What could it be? What couldn't it be? What might it be? What might it not be? And you know, it's not local radio interference. Has Jocelyn wired the radio telescope up wrong? Probably. No, because it's seen by a separate radio telescope with their own receiver and their own chart recorder. Very hush-hush, that one. But it's a big problem. It's got short pulses, steep pulses, which implies it's small. But it's also, I'm now keeping observing it every day, it keeps a steady beat. It's not getting tired. It's inexhaustible, apparently. It keeps beating. We can measure it to six or seven decimal places. And if it can do that, it must be big. So it's big and it's small. Aha. A colleague managed to get an estimate of the distance. It was about 200 light years away. It means it's well within the galaxy and it's not local. So it's not Joe Bloggs driving down the road from work. It's something astronomical.
We did quite seriously worry that it might be little green men, intelligence. And if it is little green men, they probably live on a planet which goes round their sun. And then there's what we call Doppler effect. You know the racing car syndrome? Meow! Who's had a small boy doing that? Pitch changes. Meow! Because when it's coming towards you, the waves cram up on each other. When it's moving away from you, the waves stretch out. So, if this really is little green men, if, they probably live on a planet that's going round their sun. And when the planet's coming towards you, you see a higher pitch, shorter period. And when the planet's moving away from you, you see a longer period. So I looked. And there was no, do well, I was going to say there's no Doppler shift. Actually, we did find a Doppler shift because the Earth is going round the sun. So if you imagine you're the little green men and I'm on Earth, as I go round the sun, some of the time I'm coming towards you and your pulses pile up, and sometimes I'm moving away from you and your pulses stretch out. So we proved that the Earth went round the sun, but otherwise not making great progress. And then, fortunately, I found a second, and a third, and a fourth. There are not four lots of little green men, all choosing to signal to planet Earth. Why? Using a curious technique. Why? This has to be something natural. And we went on from that, and the field has flourished since then. This is a cartoon version of what we think these things are. Uh, here on the right, you see a very small, a very compact star, about the same mass as our sun, but only 10 kilometers radius. It's spinning about a vertical axis. It has a very strong magnetic field, which for some reason is offset. And from the magnetic poles, there come beams of radio waves, uh, which this cartoon is meant to illustrate. If the beam shines in our face, we see a pulse pulse, but not from the other pole, which misses us. So we only see a fraction of these stars, only the ones who happen to have the orientation that allows one pole to face the Earth. So I think that story, apart from being quite a good story, has some relevance, because I think the main factor was I was so sure I was going to get thrown out of Cambridge. I had so much imposter syndrome that I was working really, really thoroughly and spotted this signal which occupied about one part in 10 million of my paper. So what else can women do in astronomy? Or how many women are there in astronomy? There aren't enough. It's better than in physics, but it's not good. And a group of women wrote to the International Astronomical Union, which is the international body that covers astronomers in every country, nearly every country in the world. Uh, they wrote to the then secretary, Derek McNally, British man, saying they were concerned about the shortage of women in astronomy and would the IAU do something about it. And the IAU was not going to do something about it, definitely not. It's a social issue, says the IAU, and the IAU has voted the promotion of astronomical science, and to that extent has tried not to cross the line into matters of social science. So, no. Dressed up, but no. Then, a few years later, Derek McNally has relinquished the post. Johannes Andersen from Denmark is the general secretary. And Johannes has a wife who is also an astronomer, Birgitta. Johannes had no trouble getting a job as an astronomer in Denmark. Birgitta had huge problems. And Johannes wondered if it was because she was a woman. 
And he realized that as general secretary of this International Astronomical Union, he had access to the membership data of that organization and that it was recorded by gender. There were only two genders in those days, male and female, but at least it was something. So Johannes started recording the IAU membership data segregated by gender. And that has continued, and the database now has been going for about 20 years. So I keep an eye on this database. I'm a bit selective. Um, I look at countries with more than 200 astronomers, so that the root n error is not too big. And I look at the percentage of each country's membership that is female. And this is data from just over a year ago. And I'm looking at countries with more than 200 astronomers. There aren't so many of them. Italy is the best, 28% female. France, Brazil, Spain, Russian Federation. The world average um, for the IAU is 19%. So below the average are Netherlands, Australia, USA, Canada, India, China, Germany. Look at the UK, Japan. Japan is no surprise. I shout at the UK. We used to be somewhere up about here. Go back five years. The relevant body in Britain has not been paying attention and we have slipped down the league table. Now Switzerland is not a big enough cohort to show on this. I will leave you to guess where it might show, <laughs> <laughs> if it did. Um, but I can see some patterns, and maybe you can as well. Um, Southern Europe, quite high. South America, quite high. English-speaking world, below the world average. Netherlands has risen a lot recently. Netherlands has been allowed to recruit to some women-only positions, and this has hugely changed their position. They've gone up by about 4% in four years. Really interesting. Um, does need to be, attention needs to be paid to it. I mean, that's why the UK has slipped. Nobody's been paying attention. So, the pattern has been broadly the same all the time I've been looking at it. Southern Europe, Southern America, higher than Northern Europe, Northern America. And one can debate what that is, but it's interesting data. Few caveats. Uh, you have to be tenured. Well, you did have to be tenured. Uh, they just recently introduced a junior membership where you don't have to be tenured, and that is bringing in more young women, I must say. Um, but the national body in your country, so for us it's the Royal Astronomical Society, the national body puts names forward, and that could be a filter. So that could be going on a bit. Um, are women more often overlooked by the national bodies? Possibly, yeah. Um, if anybody wants to go back and look at the data, it's openly available, at least the current year. The current one is openly available. Um, I have the historic data because I've been doing this for a while. So I've probably said some of this. South America, Southern Europe, higher. English-speaking countries, Northwest Europe, lower. But women's brains are not that different in Southern Europe and Northern Europe. This is a cultural phenomenon. It's not to do with women's brains. Um, other subjects don't keep data in the same way, but talking to physicists and mathematicians, their impression is that there is a similar pattern for maths and physics. So what might be going on? Well, maybe astronomy is not a prestigious subject in Ruritania. Maybe it's engineering. So all the men go to engineering in Ruritania, leaving astronomy open for the women. So that might be one of the factors we need to think about. Or 
maybe you live in a country where your parents are still nearby and your parents can help with the child binding, which releases the woman, more than the man, to go and be an astronomer. Or maybe you live in a country where there's a great range of incomes and in your town there are a lot of poorer women who would be only too delighted to come into your house, be your childminder, your cook, your nursery maid, your laundry maid, do all the things that you might do if you weren't the woman of being an astronomer. So, don't know how we disentangle those, but those are the kinds of factors that I see mattering. And diversity does matter. Not only is it socially more acceptable, but there's good economic arguments for having a diverse workforce. There's been work done by McKinsey and Co. in the United States, and they have found that companies that have the most diverse, both gender and ethnicity, executive and board, those companies are more robust, more flexible, and more successful than companies that are less diverse. So yes, CSEM, go for getting more women. <laughs> And with a rather nice picture of the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, one of the prime sites until the native Hawaiians started protesting about telescopes on their holy mountain, another diversity issue. But it's rather a lovely photograph, Mauna Kea at night. Thank you for your attention and your interest. Thank you. Would you mind just stand, uh, waiting on stage with me whilst we just uh, take the questions? Yeah? I know it's been a long time because we have a few questions. Thank you so much, first of all, of course. I'll, I'll put this iPad before I drop it on the floor. Um, there ha there's a first question about, of course, the imposter syndrome. How do you think we can tackle the imposter syndrome? You said earlier on that you compensated by working very, very much. So that's probably one solution, but what are the others? I think the others are to recognize that people might suffer from it as we now try to do in Oxford and Cambridge, and pay attention to those people, reassure them. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's feeling a bit overwhelmed. It's just the guys don't talk about it, mm. <laughs> for example. But we're going back to education, are we? Because we, we do feel that women suffer more imposter syndrome. I think there's syndrome evidence for that, yes. 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 Would that go back to education? Is there something we're doing wrong with girls when we bring them up? Um, if it's something like that, it's not just education, it's society and background and mm. pre-education. In other words, the rearing of our females. Mm. So. You were talking about cultural factors. Mm. Um, that's one of my questions. How do you change culture? How do you stop the Americans being married? <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Uh, thank you. <laughs> no, but you see what I mean. We've got some individual inci incentives. Uh, yes. We can promote, we can have programs, we can yes. politically decide that we're going to change society. That's one thing. Okay. But then there's all these cultural aspects that I don't have the answer, of course, uh, that you don't know. Is it mentality? Is it, how does it weigh on us, really? I don't know what toy shops look like here, but toy shops in Britain have a pink section and mm. a blue section. And the pink section is pretty princess, makeup, cookery, nurse. Mm. All passive things. And the blue section is maybe, maybe too much, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, we gender our children very, very early. Mm. And that makes it so hard to get girls into science mm. because science is in the blue room. That's what I was going to say, yes. Yeah. Physics, experiment, laboratories, and all that. Yeah. That's in the yeah. boys' room, yeah. Mm. There are some few questions uh, about your, your research. Uh, going back first of, all to, uh, first, of course, to the pulses, when did you uh, realize that it was huge, that it was really important, your discovery? Finding a second one was hugely reassuring. Mm. You know, when you've got one anomaly, 
Well, there's possibly a lot of ways you can explain it. When you start getting more than one, you've got the beginnings of a pattern. You're on the home straight. Mm. Mm. So you were realizing that at that point that you were making a very exciting discovery. Yes. Mm. And the second one was remarkably like the first one in terms of pulse period. So it was clearly the same family. Mm. We have a question concerning your current research interests. Mm -hmm. Diversity in astronomy? I'm no longer standing on a creaky yes. platform. Um, I'm no longer research active. Um, the brain is 78 years old and doesn't seem to work quite as well as it used to. Uh, it I'm doesn't doing, show. <laughs> I'm doing a lot of talks for various publics about mm -hmm. bits of astronomy, women in science, things like that. So, and because I have a visiting position in Oxford, I'm part of a department and hearing all the seminars and colloquia and hearing all the news and just occasionally dropping in, have you thought about? Mm. And usually they haven't, so, but I'm not an active researcher. <laughs> but you have also have a very likable interest, poetry and astronomy. Yes, yes. That Tell us about that. That rather came by accident. I do a lot of talks to all sorts of audiences and on one occasion, I was speaking to a group of women of about my own age, talking about how big the universe was. And a friend in the audience said to them, do you know Elizabeth Jennings' poem, Delay? Well, Elizabeth Jennings is now on the school syllabus in England, but wasn't when I was a kid. Um, and she gave me a copy of this poem. And it's about the delay in light reaching us from the stars and how our lives might change during that delay. I thought, this is good. It was only eight lines long, so it's good. I wonder if there's any more where this came from. And started digging around. And there is a lot of poetry with astronomical themes. Um, so it's been You're really You're collecting all these? Gathered them poetry. in, yes. Yeah. Still gathering, yes. yes. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah. Um, there are questions about your personal role models. Did you have uh, models to follow? No. No. That's something we need to change, isn't it? Oh, I think it is changing, as there's now more mm. of us You're doing science. Mm. But no, there wasn't a woman. Um, and because there wasn't a woman, I had some rather bad advice at times. You know, women can't do this. Mm. So and that's the question we always ask m women. We probably should start asking men these questions too. But how did you combine career and family life? With considerable difficulty. I worked part time for about 15 years when I had a child. Mm. Um, and married to a man who had to move job every five or 10 years to get promotion. Um, the system was, you know, he'd come home and say, I think it's time we moved. And he'd start scouring the advertisements. He said, if I went for a job in Leicestershire, might there be any astronomy place nearby? And I say, yes. Mm. So he'd go for that job, and if he got it, I would then write a begging letter to that astronomy place. So you were following, but he was supportive? Reasonably. Reasonably. Up, Could up have done better. <laughs> <laughs> When did you decide to study astronomy? Uh, it was an era when an era <laughs> when women would typically be pushed towards being homemakers. Yes. I know that you've been telling me yes. about the story of when you were at junior school and they separated the class in two groups. Yeah. Boys were sent to science class and girls to domestic cookery. Cookery. Cookery classes, yes. So what yeah. happened? Yeah, no, there was for a you? This was in Northern Ireland, which is not the most enlightened bit of Europe, I have to say. Um, <laughs> so my parents protested. Uh, the local doctor had a daughter in my class. He protested. And the second time the science class met, there were three girls and all the boys. And we did physics that first term. And I came top of the class. Well done. <laughs> Um, I don't remember the teacher praising me. I do remember the teacher berating the boys for allowing a girl to beat them. 
But that was motivating, though. <laughs> Chemistry wasn't such fun, and I hated what they called biology, drawing flowers and labelling the parts. <laughs> so I decided quite early on that physics was my thing, and that kind of got reinforced as I went through secondary school. And by the time I was leaving secondary school, I had decided I wanted to be a radio astronomer. Radio because you work in the daytime. Mm. You don't have to work at night, normally. Um, and it was a huge help knowing what I wanted to do because it meant I knew I had to get an honours physics degree before going on to do research. And with that kind of focus, it helps you be a bit more determined a bit more stubborn, a bit more thick-skinned, hmm. against quite a lot of bad behaviour by other people. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you ever so much. We don't have more time for other yeah. questions, but you know that there's time for networking during yes. coffee break and at the end of the afternoon. And I should also say that your whole conference has been recorded, so you'll be able to watch it again whenever you need to. Thank you ever thank so, you. Thank you so much. Sorry. Thank you. Professor. Jocelyn Bell Burnell. So, on our journey now towards uh, diversity in the STEMs, we are going to focus on research and academia and management. So I'm happy to welcome on stage Dr. Patricia Widmer. <laughs> Round of applause. Patricia Widmer, she's uh, the Director for Diversity and Management Programs at the University of St. Gallen. That's right, and you've also uh, uh, launched a Women's Leadership Program, uh, Certificate Program, Women Back to Business. So loads of advice coming from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much and uh, welcome from my side. And it's a huge honor to actually be on the same stage as um, Dame Judy Bell uh, Burrell. It's um, just so inspiring to hear, um, you know, women that have paved our ways. Um, that's why we are here today. I mean, we really are so thankful what you have done for all of us. And I completely agree, and I will go to that a little bit uh, later in my speech, how important role models and mentors are, female mentors for that matter. So I would like to um, really talk a little bit about the numbers um, in STEM, but also about the culture, because the culture has a huge effect why not um, there are more men, more women in the STEM field, and we will see about some statistics, why that is, and what can be done about it. So I want to start really with some numbers um, without any words, and I will give you some explanation. So let's start with the number 30. We heard it in the opening, obviously, that this is the number, more or less, of female students in the STEM field. But it's also the number, um, the 30%, um, a little bit less than 30%, are female researchers worldwide. And I don't think it's enough, but it gets worse. Because the number 20 is really a number that struck me. In the largest 1,000 companies, there are only 20% of the whole employees um, and actually are going into chief investment officer positions or chief technology officers uh, position. And I think we have to change that. And how can we change that? Well, we have to really encourage the girls early on, and we will see um, how we can do that. But then there's even a worse number, and that's 15. 15% 15 of women are in the workforce in STEM. It is increasing, but it's still actually at a very slow pace. So basically, that means that in a company where you have 1,000 employees, only 150 are women. And, um, I think this is a problem because it's only half of how many women we have actually in the STEM field at the university. So we are losing a lot of women on the way. And that's a huge problem. And we, uh, I'm so happy that you talked about the imposter syndrome because this is exactly where we have to look into. Because women are the tax 
untapped resources. This is really an untapped pool. And sometimes I even say a little bit provocatively that maybe some companies are not suffering enough, that they are not watching out what can be done to really increase the number of women, um, highly qualified women, in their um, employee um, pool. So we do know that it's not only an ethical matter to actually have more or less an equal a number of women in the workforce. We do know it also drives economic growth and it ensures a sustainable community worldwide, but it also drives innovation and that's why we are here today. Actually, Funny enough, there is even a study being done in the United States um, in the banking sector. That's where I am coming from. I've been working um, in banks for a number of years, and that's also where I did my dissertation about the gender disparity um, at the top of companies. How do you become a CEO in a Swiss bank? And in some of the studies in the United States, it was seen that there are also less fraud the more women are in leadership in banks. So that is not only an economical driver or an innovation driver, but it can get actually really uh, problematic uh, for the company. So the gender gaps are more likely actually in sectors that require disruptive, disruptive technical skills. We have seen that from numbers that the World Economic Forum um, has analyzed. So for example, in cloud computing, I know the numbers are super small, that's why I'm going to tell you, but it just shows that the cloud computing, women only make up 14% of the workforce. In engineering, 20%. And in data and artificial intelligence, um, about 32%. So while the eight job clusters that we see here typically experience a high influx of new talent at current rates, those inflows, uh, inflows are actually not fast enough and they do not rebalance this occupational segregation. So we have to uh, watch out that we do not lose the women on that journey and we have to make sure that actually even not only at the universities but also once they are in the workforce that they don't leave their jobs because in a study we have seen that unbelievably the proportion of women to men in tech roles has actually declined over over um, the past 35 years and only half of young women who got into the tech drop out by the age of 35. If we compare that to other jobs, that's actually a really huge number, because in other job types, it's only 20%. And so now we have to ask ourselves, why is that? Well, it has a lot to do with the culture. We have heard that. But it's not only the culture of a country, but also the culture at the university, uh, the culture in the workforce. It's about the stereotypes, we heard that. It's not, I mean, obviously the toy section, but it's also the images that we have in our head, you know. I do have a son and a daughter, and I really want them both to actually have equal opportunities. And it goes both ways. I do know that we today speak about more women in STEM, but believe me, I'm also a huge advocate for more men and boys in, for instance, very caring activities such as daycares, nursing, and so on, because it goes both ways. It's not a one-way street. So what can we do to make the workforce and the universities um, a little bit more inclusive? Well, actually, there is um, this wonderful researcher, um, uh, Shore, who um, actually, what she did, she was um, uh, trying to find out what about an inclusive culture is. So here you have, like typical from a business school, the two by two matrix. Um, on one hand, you have the value in uniqueness, and on the other hand, the belonging to a team and an organization. So what you really want to see is that we all feel inclusive, right? So we can be our true self, we can be unique, but at the same time, we feel belonged to a team or an organization. Unfortunately, that is usually not the case. 
On the other extreme, what you don't want to have is the exclusion, because then that's what exactly what is happening. You actually leave, because you cannot be yourself and you do not belong. So that's definitely not a match. But there are two other uh, possibilities that can happen in this matrix. One actually is the assimilation. The assimilation starts to happen when we actually feel belonged, but we cannot be ourselves. For instance, sometimes we say foreigners are the better Swiss because they're super punctual and on time, for instance. Or when we go in STEM, we see a lot that women start to behave like men. But we want to have diversity. We don't want to have more acting the same as the majority that we already have. On the other hand, we have the differentiation. The differentiation is really when you start to feel like an outsider, because you can be yourself, you want to be unique, you don't want to change, but you don't feel belonged. Eventually, you leave, and then you will lose a talent as a company. So we have found that an inclusive culture, one that is not only diverse on paper, but that enables everyone to have a choice and a voice is the master key that unlocks opportunities for women who are studying and working in technology. So I brought you some numbers that shows how important such an inclusive culture is. And I want to start with the university. And we have heard that um, from um, Dame Jocelyn Bill Burnell. The differences between the most and least inclusive environments are huge, as you can see here. So, for instance, in less inclusive colleges, one in four women feel like an outsider. Well, I don't have to go further. You probably know what's going to happen. But just one in 20 women feel that the way that way in an inclusive culture college. So we really have to make sure that women in universities feel belonged, but they can still be themselves. So that they also see a way after their college, what kind of roles can they take on? Are they comfortable to ask questions or do they feel like an outsider? And the same actually goes in the workforce. So for instance, what we've seen here is that in less inclusive workplaces, the likelihood that a woman will advance to manager is just 28%. But compared to men, there it's 40%. So the gender difference dif disappears in more inclusive workplaces. What we have found in studies is that it's crucial to have role models and female mentors for women. A lot of companies that we work with have mentorship programs, but they assign, for instance, a 55-year-old man to a 30-year-old woman. That's not a mentorship. That can be a sponsorship. That man can talk about that woman behind closed doors to promote her, to kind of, you know, support her. But mentoring has a lot to do with sharing experiences and being a role model. And therefore, I really advocate to actually implement um, mentorships from women to women. And at that, at an early stage. I see my daughter just graduated from high school this year, and I wish they had some sort of mentorship during high schools already. Because it's overwhelming for high schoolers, especially for girls, to know which path is the right way. Do I fit in or not? I mean, obviously, parents can do a lot. But you all know, at that age, parents just have rather a small influence. You know, The peers are important. And maybe a few years older role model would be key. So the key to have more women in tech really is to have um, a more inclusive culture. So we, it is a cultural factor. We have to have bold leadership. Um, we have to also see an empowering, an empowering environment and a comprehensive action with regards to really allies in the workplace. And that have to be men. So there are three overlapping factors, um, and um, 
when those three actually come together, we are in the sweet spot. And that's the belonging. So it's about equity, it's about inclusion, it's about diversity. And all three together um, will bring us to a spot where we can bring our true self, our authentic self, every day to work. And then that's when we thrive, that's when we are productive and bring the best performance. And so I want to end with um, a testimonial that I really like a lot because it shows that I'm not a huge fan of um, like talking about equality, that everything has to be the same for everybody, but we have to have the same chances. So equal does not mean identical. Saying women and men are equal doesn't mean one is saying men and women have no differences. That's why we want diversity. It simply means those differences should not translate to different levels of access to benefits and opportunities in society, in school, universities, and in the workforce. And that's why I'm very happy to be, for instance, on the advisory board of the Swiss chapter of women in tech to really support that um, movement. And I really am happy to support all young women who would like to go down that way. I have to be honest, when I was in high school and graduated, I never thought that this could be a path for me. I never knew a woman um, in my circle of life um, that was uh, um, in STEM. Looking back, maybe that could have been an option. I'm very happy that I went into business, but um, I really would love to see more girls to at least have the option and the choice. It's okay if they decide differently, but at least they have the same opportunities and benefits. And with that, I thank you so much for your attention. very much. Thank you very much for this global overview and for the key to a more inclusive uh, uh, world. And we'll hear more of you at the round table. We'll be happy to hear more advices. Perfect, thank, thank you very much. And we're going to look down deeper now into what uh, prevents inclusion stereotypes, biases. Um, and uh, issues in the selection and recruitment of women with Professor John Antonakis. Welcome. Professor John Antonakis from the HEC of Lausanne. You're a professor of organizational behavior and you like to look into psychology as well. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here. I, at our school, we also had to sort into home economics and carpentry or metalwork. And I wanted to do home economics, which included cooking, uh, but I was not allowed. Um, but I did, I did get back to, to doing that when I was in the army, and I bluffed my way um, into becoming a cook, uh, even though my uh, profession was sniper and a musician. Um, I, I wanted to get away from being stuck up in a mountain uh, looking at Turkey on the other end. Um, so I got to cook uh, a lot when I was doing the army. Anyway, it's uh, very nice to be here. I do uh, research um, as a social scientist. Uh, coming from an economics angle and a psychology uh, angle, I have no idea how my career turned out. I didn't plan anything. I was very fortunate to have a, a very smart uh, older sister who um, studied pure maths and computer science, and I always used to ask her questions, you know, what is she doing there? Well, you know, what do these COBOL codes mean? Pascal, this, that, and the other. And before I knew it, um, I was a professor um, and, and teaching causal analysis. I also teach programming, uh, Monte Carlo simulation. I also still do experiments. That's my bread and butter. Uh, but, I, but I really have my sister to thank for um, uh, steering me towards more, um, let's say, scientific aspects in what I do. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the problem of stereotyping and bring it into the business world and into the world of academia and, and show uh, also how I go about when I speak to companies about diversity and inclusion and how um, we should really gather data um, in, uh, and, and see what's happening because it's only with data that we can change mindsets and hopefully change culture. Um, a lot of what I do is also focused on causal analysis. I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, if you heard uh, the, the people who won the Nobel Prize, Card, Imbens, um, and Angrist, uh, is, is doing research in, in, um, in, in trying to uncover causal effects in field 
situations where you can't really manipulate exogenously a variable. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of stuff and a lot of uh, hoopla about um, diversity in, in many ways and, and companies doing research, which is really not causally identified. So if we have time also in the round table, I'd like to uh, offer a couple of words um, on, on how we can actually estimate the causal effect of diversity and outcomes. So right now, a lot of the stuff is very correlational and not trustworthy from a, from a causal perspective, but I'll, I'm gonna come back to that. So just very quickly, this is stuff that you know, but uh, just um, quickly, what informs my research, and, I, and uh, I studied social cognition initially, and by the way, I also had imposter syndrome all the way until 2009, when I published my first article in, in a very big general journal, um, Science, and, and only then, and when my research was not debunked, and when people reanalyzed my, my results and read, then there was, it was literally in 2009 where I actually felt at the ripe old age of 38 that I, I wasn't an imposter. Anyway, the point is the following, and, and this is what drives the problem, is that people are very quick to size us up. They look at our age, our sex, our height, and put a price on our tag. If we look like a million dollars, they fill in the blanks and assume we have lots of positive characteristics if we don't, we have a problem. So these classification mechanisms help happen very quickly. The fill in the blanks happens very quickly. People may make a correction to the initial classification, but that's only if they have sufficient information to do so. Um, the monitor here is not working, uh, technicians. If you want to turn it on, that would be nice. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to turn the, the monitor. Um, so the problem of uh, uh, stereotyping is applying to gender works in two ways. Uh, whether we're looking at STEM or leadership is that women are usually described in ways that don't concord with the agentic male stereotype. So for leadership or STEM positions, um, you know, people uh, assume that we need someone who's tough, who's achievement oriented, um, and, and these are not characteristics that overlap with a female prototype of being nurturing and kind. So from a descriptive perspective, it makes it less likely for women to be chosen, and also it makes women less likely to, to uh, put themselves forward because they don't see sufficient women. So this is a self-exclusion mechanism that occurs. And then from a prescriptive stereotyping perspective, if a woman shows the stuff um, that men would show stereotypically in that situation, she's not liked and pays a penalty for that. So this creates a problem and suboptimal evaluation decisions. So um, Heilman wrote a lot about that and she said that the context, depending on how typed it is, gender typed initially, and the typing comes from cultural historical trends and the more we are exposed repeatedly to, to data, the more likely it's going to harden stereotypes. So if we you know, think of a, a leader in a military setting, we're going to think of a male. Why? Because we've been repeatedly exposed to generals being males. Now, of course, that's changing. But the problem is that individual differences like sex, and I'm going to talk more about sex here than um, other uh, aspects of diversity, but of course there's age diversity, there's, there's ethnic diversity, there's, there's neurodiversity, there's all kinds of diversities. So the context creates a prototype and expectation, and if there's overlap, um, with what we expect, then the person gets a favorable evaluation. Um, if there's not an overlap and there's a lack of fit, they get a negative evaluation. So this typing has dramatic effects. Let me give you an example. Here they coded um, the proportion of um, male-dominated themes and words in different jobs and in advertisements that they made for for jobs, so masculine wording in male-dominating occupations versus feminine wording, and how would that attract or not women in certain areas? So even putting out a basic job advertisement, or what would make for a fellow in the Royal Society, or what have you, um, the, the way the words are given um, does not, um, it's flashing now, okay. <laughs> It always happens. When I gave my TED talk, my monitor also crashed about five minutes before, uh, but I had memorized it very well, so I didn't need to turn back and look at my slides. So I think it's always, they're always testing me, the technicians, but it's okay. They, I'll manage. Um, so you see what happens when uh, masculine worded advertisements are, 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 are put out. You know, the female, females um, will not sort in to positions um, that are written up in male stereotypical terms, and, and nor will males to positions 
where that are more female oriented so you know if you want your son to be uh, in a more uh, let's say uh, uh, nurturing kind of situation they won't do it if it's described in in, in ways that concord with a, a stereotype that is associated with a woman and that's because people want to defend their gender identities and that's problematic so you know if you put out a, an advertisement you know directeur it's not going to attract as many women um, as if you put directeur directrice or lighter lighter in okay um, so let me just give you some examples about these double standards and their consequences. So, for example, you know, men are allowed more degrees of freedom in how they use humor, in how they express their emotions, whether they are soft emotions or hard emotions. It's really not a problem. If it doesn't work, it's okay, I'll manage. Um, and uh, it goes on, all flashes. Um, so, you know, showing anger can be very detrimental because it's not associated uh, with a woman's stereotype. Only, you know, men can show anger um, because, you know, when men who do that, you know, they know what they want, they can, uh, you know, they're tough, uh, tough, uh, you know. If a woman does it, she's out of control, she's hysterical, what have you. So in this experiment, they got a male and a female that were pre-tested to look equally competent. They have the same CV, they answer the same questions in the same way in a simulated interview. And in one version, a woman gets upset, the man gets upset. In the other version, they don't. And it's for a high-ranking and a low-ranking position. So we create eight experimental conditions. We take a population of people. We randomize them to one of the eight conditions. They only see one, you know, just like if you get a vaccine or a placebo, similar kind of thing. And we want to estimate the causal effect of getting angry on inferences of status, on, on how hireable the person is, and things like that. Um, interestingly, um, let's just focus on, on the left-hand side here. So if a woman shows anger, um, and she's rated on a scale from zero to seven on status conferral, the mean is 469, and the man gets a mean of 6.19. So the man is seen as higher status if he shows anger. These are standard deviations in parentheses. Um, the salary that is offered to the man is 50% higher than the woman. Um, the man is seen as more competent, and the only thing where the woman wins on is out of control. Um, you know. <laughs> So again, this is the same thing. It's exactly the same thing, but just associated either with a man or a woman. So this is crazy stuff. Um, I was asked for a Swiss company to um, help them to improve their recruitment processes, and I was uh, invited to look at an assessment center and how they were doing stuff. And, and I was appalled to see um, that uh, they were not using the, the, the latest in psychometric testing and selection. So, you know, that initially, the people who were hired to go in there had to have a certain degree, had to have certain legal capabilities. After working for the company for, it's actually a governmental organization, for a few years, they had to do a mini MBA, um, and only then could they go to the assessment center. So there's no way that the Swiss Roman people were more stupid or less competent than the Swiss Germans. And there's no way that an older person uh, was, was, was less competent either, because these people had pre been pre-selected and met a certain level of competence and experience before um, going to the assessment center. And I was told these assessments were done by experts, and I'm talking about five different consulting companies. Over time, we had over 500 candidates. We got access to all the files. You know, the, the, the high-level manager didn't want to give me this data. You know, he said, I want you as a consultant just to tell us what to do. I said, what? You know, it's like you're telling me you want to fly the plane somewhere, and, and I can't see the, the instruments. Where have you been? Where are you flying? What's the weather like? And, and look at this. It's really interesting. Um, candidates from Latin backgrounds, Swiss Romans and Swiss Italians, were much less likely than Swiss Germans to get a promotion. Um, and if you were a double minority, a female Swiss Roman, you were really screwed. It was... <laughs> You know, but even the guys were. So, you know, guys, listen up here. Huh? And who's in the red? Who do you think was in the red? It was the older people. So look at the probability of getting... So, you know, we ran an audit probit uh, model, so we, the, the, the multinomial probit, so, so, you know, good evaluation, mitigated evaluation, or bad one. So we're looking at the probability of getting either one, that one, or the other as a function of the democratic characteristics. So the older people got, the lower the probability of getting a good evaluation, and obviously the higher of getting a, a, a bad evaluation. So, you know, this is really not fair. Uh, it really isn't, and I'm saying this as a 52-year-old guy now who may decide to transition jobs uh, someday. Um, I found similar results in an NGO that I looked at. Again, I was in an assessment where they, the board 
which was mostly composed of men, were uh, evaluating people who had gone through different missions and whether they should get a promotion. I remember a woman uh, being described as, you know, she's really tough, you know, she's been there, she's been there, Afghanistan, whatever, this, that. But, you know, sometimes she uses her elbows, you know, and she, and she stomps on people's toes. And a very similar profile of a guy who um, had similar missions and a similar personality outlook and all that. Oh, yeah, he knows when he has to put his foot down. And I thought that's really curious how they described it. So I, I got the transcripts of all the discussions the top level committee had before the promotion. I gave them to my assistants. We removed the definite pronoun and uh, articles like, you know, le or la. They wouldn't know it was a man or a woman. We made everything la personne. Um, and we looked to see how often a man was described in positive terms versus non-positive terms. We also looked to see what proportion of women and men had good or mitigated evaluations. Again, these people are pre they pre-selected. They're all super smart at the beginning. If we're not promoting women, then either your selection methods are crap and you're hiring stupid women, or the promotion systems and the pipeline creates bias. And you know, this is real data from the real world where we find that a man has a 91% higher probability of getting a good evaluation, which then drove the promotion. Um, or, or very good. So, you know, only these people here got promotions, not these. And that was strongly associated with being a man. Males had a higher proportion of positive adjectives, 34% higher. Um, and this is incredible. Age discrimination was rife across the board, which also is not fair. And age and being male predicted evaluations, future job level, and salary level. Now, surely we wouldn't see this in the academic world. Well, <laughs> Dame Joycelyn, um, I think, is a living example. And uh, what she said before, I mean, the most horrible thing, uh, um, you know, entering, was that in Scotland, you said, when, you, when women entered in presentations, they were woof whistled and clapped at. I mean, you know, it's unbelievable stuff. But, okay, let's zoom forward 30 years, well, I don't know, maybe 20 years. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly when the timeline was. Um, but, you know, you surely wouldn't find this in the academic world, especially at business schools where we have psychologists and experts and professors this and that, and we do research on diversity and we have OB departments and all that stuff. So what did they do in the study? Very clever. They looked to see at all the top business schools in the United States where one had the possibility of being promoted to an endowed chair. So, you know, you start off as lecturer, instructor, what have you, assistant professor, associate professor, full professor. So all the full professors in the top schools have the possibility, if they have the financing, to give an endowed chair to uh, someone who's worthy. And there's one criterion that matters, only one your research and your, your, your impact, in other words, your output and the quality. And that's so easy to look at it. You can open up Scopus, Web of Science, you can see how much someone's published. Now, irrespective of whether it is easier or harder for a man to publish, let's not talk about that for the moment, we can perfectly observe what the person has published. And what they did here is they created an index of publication output and quality and impact um, citations, and, and it's, it's uh, standardized, so zero means the average, so one means one standard deviation above the mean, minus one, one standard deviation below the mean. So look at the two logistic curves for males and females. The male curve is always higher, which means the male always has a higher probability of becoming an endowed chair across all levels of competence. So if you're not very competent, it's close to zero, but the man is still higher. If you look at the, at the mean, the probability of a man uh, getting an endowed chair is 44%, and the probability of a woman getting it is 33%. If you want to have an 80% probability of becoming an endowed chair, look what happens. A male has to show this amount of research, and the female has to show this amount of research impact. So for the same level of promotability, a woman has to show much more, is judged at a much higher standard. This is not fair. Okay, it's really not fair because it means at a particular level you're going to have more competent women and perhaps less competent men. Um, this stuff affects also higher ability in STEM settings. So this is for a, a, a lab manager where you have the same CV, uh, same person uh, applying for a hypothetical position and then you ask scientists to evaluate the higher ability of the person. Now, if I'm given a CV and it's called, you know, John Favre versus Jane Favre, I should evaluate the same CV 
the same, the same CV in the same way, but you change the sex of the person being um, uh, who's postulating, and you get a very big difference in terms of competent. The woman is seen as less competent, less hireable, less likely to be mentored. And again, look at the salary starting for this technician position. You know, much, much lower for the female versus for the, the male. So, you know, this goes on and on and on. Wait, they create prostheses, um, uh, bigger, uh, sorry, bigger people made bigger by prostheses, uh, professional uh, makeup artists. And so you have a man or a woman 20 pounds heavier or lighter, and then uh, they, in a simulated interview for a computer position back of the house. So they're not selling lingerie at Victoria's Secret or something like that. So it has absolutely no bearing on the customer uh, outlook in any way how this person looks. Um, so a female that's overweight is, is judged as much less competent and less hireable than a man who's over, overweight. It's really not fair. Um, you know, data from a German company where the mean, this is the mean level of weight, you see, if a woman is skinnier, she'll earn more money. If she puts on more weight, she earns less money, where, whereas it works the opposite for male. You know, so you know, if you've got a little bit of a brioche, you know, it means we have money to, uh, to live the good life. Now, <laughs> This is the only experiment I'm aware of that manipulates the proportion of diversity in teams and estimates the causal impact of it. Anything else that I've seen is purely correlational, and we need to take it with a pinch of salt, more, more likely with handfuls of salt. But anyway, the point is here, you see a curvilinear relationship between proportion of women and then the amount of um, sales that are generated by these teams. So this is a really clever, well-done field experiment um, by Hogan, Dunn, and Ahn in management science. So, apart from that, there are some observational studies. I'm going to give you one um, in my two minutes that are left. Um, in management, you know, we are 20, 30 years behind in, in research standards compared to epidemiology, compared to medical sciences, compared to economics. And so much rubbish has been written. One of the rubbish things that have been written is apparently that when women get power, they turn into these super queen bees. They, the only ones who uh, will have the power, they don't like to share it with junior women, and they won't develop junior women, so therefore we shouldn't hire women because they are the most uh, worst enemies of women. Uh, this is just Google queen bee theory, you'll see it. It's a very established theory in management psychology. Complete crap as far as I'm concerned. And let me tell you why I say that. I'm sorry I get a bit annoyed. I have two girls myself, so I, um, you know. Uh, Queen bees do exist, but in beehives. Now, this powerful metaphor with sloppy research, you know, do you know a woman who acted like a queen bee? Of course I do. But how many women don't act like queen bees? How many men act like super queen bees uh, versus men who don't? So, you know, if you go fishing in certain ponds and do, you know, case study research in that sense, of course you're going to find what you're looking for. You need to look at the whole distribution. You need to do uh, some random sampling, or you need to uh, find an exogenous shock of variance to see, do women actually do this? Now, I can't go around the world and randomize women to, to manage companies. That's the only way we could know the causal effect. Any other way is not possible. But is a cool study that I accepted at the journal I edited, the Leadership Quarterly, a very high-impact journal in, um, in, in my field. Um, and they looked at mayoral elections, where the margin of victory was so small that it's as if random. So this is called a regression discontinuity design in economics and in medicine, and it's used a lot. And it turns out that uh, in mayoral elections, where they looked at many, many elections in all the municipalities in Brazil, and they used as kind of controls companies that were in the same municipality, when a female wins in a quasi-random fashion and her power is solidified, not only does she redress the bias previously um, uh, instituted by the typical um, uh, male-dominated uh, culture, by promoting more women to higher levels of power and also closing the pay gap between men and women. So I will conclude with a quote that I gave in the face of Mr. Hans Rudolf Merz um, about 15 years ago. I don't remember when he was president of Switzerland. I was asked to come in and talk about the importance of diversity. And I, and I made a strong moral case for it. Um, I indirectly made the, an economic case for it, again, tell, bearing in mind that all the stuff that's put out by the consulting companies um, and catalysts in particular are very correlational. Typically, large companies which hire more women also are more profitable, but that doesn't necessarily mean 
mean that the women are making more, more, more profitable. There could be other factors involved. But um, th that's not the point. The, the, the point that I said is that it's unfair that we are holding women to different standards, which means that at particular levels of power, women who are there are more competent than the men who are there. So I said to him, with all due respect, Mr. Matz, who was dubbed the lady killer in the coupon because he shot down every bill that was pro-female until he realized that it was wrong, and he made a lot of progress in the Department of Finance when he was, when he was federal counselor. So, um, you know, I looked at him, I smiled and laughed, and I read out a quote by Maureen Reagan, I will feel equality has arrived when we can elect to office as many women who are incompetent as the men who are already there. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, and I'm looking forward to hearing your uh, ideas on how to improve the, these uh, problems and the, the stereotypes in another way than just only changing sex, because at that point uh, I, I can't see the other solution, but you'll help us out later on. That will be at our round table with all our guests, and then you'll have another chance to put your comments and questions uh, forward on the table. Uh, we'll have two other uh, brilliant women with us in a few more, in a few more minutes, Trudy Hemmerly and Pia Sandvik. She's, uh, she'll be live from uh, Sweden. Is with us uh, from Stockholm. Thank you so much for being with us uh, connected. It's great to have you. You are CEO of uh, the Royal Institute of Technology and of RISE, the Research Institutes of Sweden. We've got two women here to celebrate, uh, two uh, life experiences, two fantastic careers that have been pursued, and we're, uh, we want to know about the glass ceiling cracking, of course. We'll start the conversation with you, uh, Pia, just probably uh, just share your story as a woman in STEMS. Uh, how did it work for you? Basically, first of all, I just have to correct. Uh, I'm, I'm the chair of KTH and the CEO of RISE. Okay. Has to be sorry, just so that it just doesn't make. Yeah. I, I was thinking about this, and I must say that even if you are making a career in academia or in business. It requires hard work. And I have to, you, you really have to realize that. And it doesn't matter if you're a woman or if you're a man, it, it takes hard work. And it also takes quite a lot of sacrifices. I have been moving around Sweden, I have, I have been um, moving from my, from my two children, where my daughter is with a girl only three and five, 60 Swedish miles. Every week I left them and I came back for the weekends and so forth. So, I think you really need to, to know that. And having said that, I think that these are one of the things that need, needs to be changed. Because I don't think that the younger people of today will actually accept a working life that doesn't give you balance in either world. So that's one thing. And um, I was thinking about when did I hit the, hit the, the, the glass ceiling? I was 40 years old, uh, I didn't have a full professor, I was only because I had a career in both business and in academia. And uh, I only was associate professor for that moment and I was headhunted for a recruitment process of one of the well-established universities in Sweden. And we were only two, two left. And then in Sweden you have a hearing, in so many of the universities you have a hearing process uh, and the the other one was a man and he was really, he was really a good professor, full professor with a strong research team and everything. And I was very strong in leadership um, since I've been doing that for quite many years, even though I was 40. I was so humiliating during that process. I was accused for so many things. Uh, my, my former husband and I, we wrote quite a lot of articles together. They were accusing me of that he had done all the work and I hadn't contributed with him anything. And I was, con con uh, I was accused of having political contacts, so that way I had, much, why I had succeeded in, the, in, in my career and so forth. I've never been politically involved at all. So I was accused for a lot of things. There was actually a voting going on in, in, the, in the board of that university, and I lost with eight to seven. 
And I was so glad that I wasn't the one that got the eight, because I was thinking afterwards, this is not university that I want to be at at all. So, and some other things is that I have always, having said that, that is actually one of the strongest memories. I think it's sometimes good to have a short memory as well, because some things you don't need to remember. This is, this is something I remember. But I have always had, have, have had supportive managers. And I've had informal managers that I've been able to call when something comes up and I was wondering, should I do that or that? What choice should I do in this situation? But I've actually also left some managers and some environments where I felt that this is not a good place for me to be. I start to feel insecure of myself, I won't get uh, the support I need and things like that as well, so I've done that as well. And for me it's been really important to stand up for my fundamental values. In what kind of environment do I want to be? What kind of leadership is important for me to be able to stand for? So I think it's really important also to have faith. Have faith in yourself and you have to be brave. Quite often you have to be brave actually, I would say. <laughs> and having said that as well, I must say I haven't been that combative also. Or com combative. I've been quite flexible and agile to sort of find solution solutions. I'm not the one that has been standing there screaming and saying females first or things like that. I sort of worked in other ways instead getting to getting things to happen for myself and for others as well. Like soft power. That I've also, sorry. No, I'm, I'm saying it's it's a, a bit of soft power. Is that what you're describing in the way you? I should say so. Mm. <laughs> Just that you, you mentioned the support of your managers, Me, female or male managers, both? I've always been working with uh, male managers, always. Who were supportive? Mm. Who were supportive? Some of them. <laughs> <laughs> but when they were, it helped <laughs> a lot. Yeah, for sure. What, what, what can you do today in your position, Pia, to uh, improve diversity, to promote women, to advise younger women? I think uh, there are some things you have to watch out, and there was also a discussion going on regarding the recruitment processes. You have to sort of, you have to be aware of the structures and processes that you have inside your organization, if you look at the organization that you are managing as rise for me then. Uh, and to be aware of, is something going on here now that, that is sort of giving an imbalance regarding the possibilities for, for gender diversity? Uh, and I think recruitment processes is one of them. You can see that at the universities as well, that you really have to be aware of that. You also have to be aware of structures. Are they actually supporting balance in life or not? Or are you sort of giving the impossible solutions for, for people to, to be able to, to take some decisions or things like that. And then I think you have to be a role model. Mm -hmm. I've always a list of, theme, of of women in my organization that I know that they stand out. If, there, if, if something happens, I have to promote them. For example, just putting up a steering committee, which you normally have a recruitment process, you probably know these situations where men pops quite fast pops names. So you have to have them. You have to have them in the front of your your brain when these discussions come up. And you also have to have KPIs. We are following the KPIs, KPIs regarding uh, gender diversity in all the, the leader positions that we have, in all the management, uh, all the management levels to see. We are struggling for to, to have 50-50. I have that in my management team, in the top management team. Uh, or at least 40, 60, you know, overall in rise. We are in 35, 65 now. But I have a good example from the automotive, from the automotive sector. We, I said, uh, I pointed out a new manager there, he was a man. Before him, there was only men in that business unit, in the, in the, in the top man, in their management team. And we had a, a process where we recruited all the leaders from the beginning again, because we're setting, rise is quite an US organization. We are going through a merging process. And he decided, he said to himself, I'm going to have a balance. I'm not going to stop until I find 50-50 of females. Then we're talking automotive, 
we are talking in electronics and things like that. You can't, there, there aren't that many females in that area, in those areas, as in, in STEM or law. He managed. He has a team today with 50 50, and they are all good. He did not, you know, you could say, okay, he probably had to sort of he could go down regarding the requirements that he had. No, he didn't. They are doing excellent. So you, but you have to struggle. You have to struggle. And I think it's also important to be really uh, formally in the recruitment process overall. So, uh, because otherwise I think you will get back to having more ways. Excellent. Um, you, you're talking from uh, Sweden and here from Switzerland, when we think of Sweden, we have like the vision of a country that is uh, uh, sensitive to equality issues like it has it's like there's a Swedish model that's recognized throughout Europe uh, is that true and did that help in mm. your case I think there are some structure or, or actually I think you could say that there's legislation legislation that has been important because we had we have had daycare or kindergarten or preschool for a long time in Sweden, which has made it possible for both parents to actually combine parenthood and work. I think that has been really important. There was also a, a legislation regarding joint taxation that was uh, was taken away uh, 30 years or, or ago or something like that, which that was before that it gave a economic advantage of being, of being in the, a housewife. Mm -hmm. They took that away. Now we have national parent parental insurance, 390 days, paid with compensation for 80% uh, of the salary, and you also have to use some, you, both parents have, have to use it as well. Of course we have discrimination law, and it's also discrimination law in working life, you can't just point out, you have to show that you have been taken aware of, of, of both, um, or given, uh, given a good uh, way of, uh, of uh, Com comparing because they are, are going to different uh, different conference. You have a school curriculum that says that the school system has to work for equality. And then I think also regarding higher education. You know, higher education in, in Sweden is free. We don't have tuition fees at all. Uh, you can have student loans for the expenses during your, your time as a student. I think those are also important things that are has helped. And there has been a lot of network and academic leadership programs and business network programs going on. We have one that has been going on for 30 years. And if you look in, in regarding in business, if you look at the top female managers that you find in the in the business area in Sweden, and they have also spread all over Europe, they all almost have gone through this program. So that's a way of also sort of giving them the networks giving them the, the mentorships needed because then you use both female and male female uh, mentors as well in those programs. And then we have KPIs. You watch every year we get we get we get the new the numbers of, of female CEOs at the stock market, we get the number of, of females in the board of directors in the stock market. We also measure that regarding yeah, that age age regarding students, number of professors, we are following it up with the government as well. So I think there's a lot of things going on. But having said that, if you look at what at the at the numbers overall, I would say that we we need to do more. You don't know how many you don't know how many female astronomers you have in Sweden. I don't think we had Sweden on the No. No. But I would say you know there's an no, sorry, pardon. No, please do, please do. You can say that there's a Swedish uh, uh, first name that is Anders. It's quite a, it's a common name. You have more CEOs on the stock market that is named Anders than you have females. <laughs> yeah, well, that says a lot. Yeah. Uh, you, you were pointing out the importance of recruitment uh, in, in, in promoting yeah. um, women and diversity in research. Um, what practical advice you would give directly to, uh, to a colleague or to or probably no, to a, a young uh, woman undergraduated? What undergraduate? What, she, what, sh what can she do? What advice would you give her? 
Uh, first of all, I would say that she has to be in a good environment with a good manager, otherwise it will, it will be problematic, I would say, if you don't get the right support. I also think, at least for me, it has been important to have networks, and I'm not just talking about networks that are, are totally connected to the works, to the different appointments I've had, but sort of getting some air sometimes, just being being in different environments uh, out when you're not at work as well. And they have also very often shown to be valuable in many different ways. And then I, I have to also say what I said at the beginning, it's a struggle. You have to be brave, you have to stand up, and you have to have strong belief in yourself. And get the mentors you need. Get the contacts you need to, to be able to just pick the phone, to, to make a phone call to somebody if you have problems, or if you don't know what to do, and things like that. Um, yeah, so some of the advices I would give. But it's not impossible. It's not impossible. Thank you ever so much. Pia, thank you ever so much for being with us uh, from, uh, from Stockholm. You can stay with us, of course. Hi. Are you all right? Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Raring Trudy. to go. Yeah, well, Trudy, we'll start with the, the, the Swedish model we just heard about. Mm -hmm. I want to hear about the Swiss model, because Trudy Hemmerle, I was expecting a Switzerdeutsch person coming up stage, but no, you were brought up in the UK, uh, although your father is Swiss, yes. uh, and you arrived in the 80s in Switzerland, Yes. and mm -hmm. you discovered the Swiss model. Yes. Switzerland's not performing, not really good at diversity. I can see it on your face, and mm. I can read it in the figures as well that we yes, you know of. Well, I mean, uh, I was, um, I guess, only in the labs. I studied chemistry, um, so when I first came, um, I was in, in the labs um, for a couple of years, first at the Paul Shell Institute, uh, and then uh, moved to Basel to, at the time, C.B. Geige. Um, and, but I rapidly moved out of the labs, partly because I'd only done a bachelor's, Mm. Um, and in order for me to do a PhD, I would have had to basically go back to university to do another year because my English bachelor's was not considered good enough. Um, and, then, and then do a PhD, but for, to do that, to go back to university, my German would already have had to be mm. good enough and, and it wasn't yet at that point, so it was still early days. So I thought, okay, what else can I do? And I moved into um, pharmaceuticals, uh, the division of, of pharmaceuticals into regulatory affairs, but focused a lot of time on the technical stuff. So the manufacturing and, and the, the technology um, side of things. Um, so I had a lot to do with people in production, uh, managers in production. I represented um, Western European countries at the time, uh, pre sort of European mutual recognition. Um, and I worked a lot with the, the manufacturing and the analytical QA uh, people, and I was usually, uh, almost always, the only woman in the room. Mm. Um, and and I, I, how did I manage that? I, 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 would, I would say I, I support Pia because I had, I guess, 50% of my managers were very supportive, uh, and the other 50% were not over the years. Um, and one has to, there's, there's a saying in, in, in a corporate world, if you wait long enough, your boss will move on. Uh, you know, get promoted to a position where he's useless or even more useless than he already is. Um, and so either you were patient and waited, did, yeah. which I was not, oh. or you moved on, uh, or you found a way to change things um, so that you didn't have to work with that person anymore. And so 50% but 50 of the time, it worked out well. But I had the advantage when I first started working, I was still quite young uh, because I hadn't done a PhD. Um, and so I, I rapidly um, had a number of leadership positions, but I was working with men who were old enough to be my dad. And I just want to highlight something because I think it's very important. The men who've spoken today already have indicated that they are the fathers of daughters. And in my experience with a lot of men that I've worked with, the ones that are the most feminist are ones who have daughters, not necessarily a boy and a girl, but two girls or more. And they, they are the most advanced male of the species. Um, and and I, would, I would support all of them. I just wish That's the other guys Alexandre would. That's good for Alexandre Pochard. Yes, exactly. This, that, you know, They've all, yes, so, um, so I'm very yeah. pl pleased with them. And that was the same, actually, in the career. So more often than not, the guys who had daughters were a lot more supportive of women in making the next career move. Um, but I, I, I had a very 
um, I'm going to say, a strange or unusual experience for the Swiss system. Unlike um, other colleagues in, in different parts of different industries, mm. um, the two times that I was pregnant, I have, I have two boys, actually, very feminist boys, I should add. Um, <laughs> Uh, they, uh, I, in both pregnancies, I was promoted. So th that mm. was very strange, very yeah. unusual situation. Rare. Yes. Mm. But I attribute that to, again, a supportive boss. Um, each time is a different one, but it was, uh, you know, a, a, someone who recognized the value and wanted to retain it, irrespective of pregnant or not. Pregnancy was just a you know, a, a brief period where one wouldn't be around a bit, but... Like um, military service for a bit, men. A bit like military service yeah. for men, um, only mine lasted less long. Um, <laughs> and it's more painful. <laughs> often. <laughs> Briefly, very painful, <laughs> but after that, um, just just uh, tough. Um, but that, but that's how it worked. And, and my husband, I have to bring up, was also extremely supportive. So finding the right guy is also key. Um, who sees the role as father as an equal responsibility with with uh, the wife, and we always used to joke because he was also we met in the company and he he, uh, he was still there, and um, he would often or we would both actually say there's only one of us still in the company after five o'clock, because one of us would go home uh, to take the over kids. the kids, and uh, and and that was just the way it was, and we would sit and plan weeks in advance, because I had a career and would occasionally travel, he would occasionally travel. Um, uh, he, he considered himself to be quite lazy, so he didn't necessarily push his career. Um, but we, we managed this way by weeks in advance, figuring out who goes home on you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, mm. Thursday, what have you. Um, and because I worked a lot with the States, uh, with people in the States, I also had the possibility of getting home, cooking dinner, you know, bathing the kids, putting them to bed, reading a story. I read all of the Harry Potters <laughs> from start to finish, that was, hey, cool mom. Um, frightened the life out of my younger one, actually, when it got to book seven, that was pretty petrifying. But anyway, um, but you know, read them a story, put them to bed, and then at, at eight, by eight o'clock, I'd be back on the phone again, talking to the people mm. in the States for a couple of hours. But it was, but I had Wednesday afternoons, well, Wednesdays off, and in the afternoon, I had time with the kids when they weren't in kindergarten or, or in school. Um, but even I struggled at the beginning where we were living, they didn't have block times. Um, so we had to figure out, you know, a solution. How and that to, always to manage comes up. Our Pia mentioned as well that the question of the balance between the career and the family, it yep. comes up in every uh, conversation with women. So, well, one solution, what you're saying is that if you have a partnership, you're yes. sharing, of course, with uh, your partner, uh, that helps. But probably we should change the, the work environment, or are there other things? There solutions? are a lot of things that one could do. Um, if you look at countries like where I originally grew up in the UK, countries that um, have maybe been through wars, where the men have been out fighting and the women have taken over the jobs in the factories, they changed their schooling system, for example, or they added childcare from a very young age um, automatically, and it was normal that women then went out to work that didn't change radically uh, a little bit but not mm. hugely um, they were almost fighting to get the women to stay home again uh, one thing that th so that's one thing I think if we had a very clear uh, schooling you know I I had all my breaks in school I had my lunch in school my grandma was one of the dinner ladies we used to call them that would then serve the the, the meals um, so we uh, you know she had like three jobs um, so we, we I, I, I think you know kids don't suffer if they're not home hanging on their mother's legs the whole time in the kitchen. Um, they learn to become more independent and mm -hmm. this is a valuable experience for them later in life. Um, and and I, I really think that we need to do more on the school system. But we also need, and Pia mentioned this, it's been gotten rid of in, in Sweden. Fortunately, we've not yet done that here. We keep trying and, and there's just not enough um, mm. momentum yet to, to change that. But we need to change the taxation system in Switzerland because we effectively uh, prevent uh, uh, women, because uh, it's usually the women, more ca not always, um, it was different in our family, but, but um, in many cases the women earn less than the men, and so if anyone has to then stay at home and look after the kids, it's got to be the woman, and that's primarily because we still add the two salaries together, put them into a higher tax bracket, 
and then you have to pay more tax. Um, and, then, and we're not very good at, mm. at changing that. So I really think we need to be individually taxing people, irrespective of they're a man or woman, mother or, or what, uh, father it's or what. It's a real political debate it's a on that. Yes, and but it, it's, it, it's it, been it a political debate in this country almost since I arrived in, in the late 80s. Making, yes. yes. Yeah. So I think that we need a stronger momentum. But I would, I'm going to um, say something maybe a bit controversial because my kids went through Swiss, Swiss schools. Um, they're both boys. Um, and we, we, I moved the family for a couple of years to the US, so they unfortunately don't speak English English anymore. They speak American English. Um, but that's, that's my problem. It's quite funny when they turn up with um, you know, a Swiss passport to, to Manchester to visit my uh, with an parents American with, a, with an American accent and a, and a Swiss passport. It's a bit weird, but, um, <laughs> but, but there you go. Um, but I, 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 I really, um, I think the Swiss school system is fantastic in, in, in many ways, um, particularly the whole apprenticeship and, and the, the flexibility mm. and the agility of the school system now compared with the United States is fantastic. But I, I really and truly believe that the schooling system, the, the teaching and the, and the parenting uh, is, is culturally, and we heard this many times already today, still um, such that we don't place enough expectations on our girls. So we expect a lot from the boys, and if they do something that fits that stereotype, that's great, they get praise. Um, but if a girl does that, I mean, I, I wanted to play football with the boys, I played them every break. Um, I, I had to um, uh, go to the headmaster and demand that in the sports lessons that I wouldn't be separated with the girls, but I could play with the boys because they were doing football and I played with the same boys every break. Um, you have to fight, I think, to, to change people's expectations. You have to have teachers in place and you have to have parenting that expects more of their daughters and that if they do seem to be a little bit different from the stereotype, that should be celebrated. Um, if they, you know, they want to have a chemistry kit, kit uh, you know, help them, buy one, let them experiment. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe not blow up the kitchen, um, mm -hmm. you know, but, but for, nurture these opportunities. I mean, they've done studies, um, and I think it was Jocelyn referred to this in the toy store, they've done studies with um, one-year-old children, not quite one-year-old because they weren't yet walking, where they had the boys, baby boys dressed up as a baby girl and a baby girl dressed up as a baby boy, and then they had men and women come in at different times to play uh, with these kids, and, and they had lots of different toys around. And the toys they picked for the girls were all soft and gooey and, um, right? Pink. And Jocelyn mentioned this mm. type of thing earlier. And, and the boys, they had cars or they had hammers and things to, to bash and, and, and put through. So both men and women, and a UN study showed that 90% of the human population, men and women, are biased mm. against women. Uh, and an, an interesting anecdote I would throw in there is, I was once asked, maybe about five years ago, and this was a big eye-opener for me, I was asked by a colleague, we're looking for um, CEO of a particular association that's an important one. Could you think of some names? You're very familiar in the health tech field. So I sat down with a cup of coffee one afternoon and I started to write some names down. And at some point after five minutes, I realized all the names I'd written down were men. Hmm. Me, I did that. What the hell, mm -hmm. right? So if it, quite naturally without realizing, so I then took two hours and I sat in front of my LinkedIn connections and went from Searching A to women. Z. <laughs> and looked at each profile and decided that they fit, yes or no. And I picked out a list that in the end had more women. Mm. So That's what that, Pia if, was saying yeah, earlier on. If I always can, have if I your list that. as a manager, always have your yes, list of exactly. names of women to, be, to promote. promote. Yeah, yeah, that's the the the, the bias. Why you 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 have ad advised? Um, you've done management and so forth. What do we gain from diversity? We've seen a few figures uh, on. Um, I think it was John Schoinger's. Oh no, sorry, it was Patricia that showed us as well uh, why it was good for for um, companies. But what do we gain from diversity? Better solutions. Right, um, mm. you don't end up. Men have a tendency if it's only men in the room or very few female voices, 
they reinforce each other's um, beliefs. There's a, a lot of um, sort of, um, yeah, testosterone-driven decisions. Uh, you know, the hierarchy uh, plays a big role. And, and I, I know it's funny, but it's actually not funny. Um, and I've seen it so many times in senior leadership meetings where this phenomenon happens and women have a tendency not to be heard. And so we have to find a soft way of, of getting across the same message and it can be from very simple things to some things that are very, very complex. But we, we need to find a way to get our voices heard and it doesn't happen enough. But when there's at least a third of the people in the room that are women, um, it changes the dynamic. Mm -hmm. And I've had a colleague, um, a really great leader, um, still in the pharmaceutical industry, but a different company to Novartis these days. Um, and she uh, actually had an experience running a production site in Germany for Novartis at the time, where they were all men, and she was the first person, female, to be in, in that facility in a leadership role, and she was in charge. And she had one uh, position open, another one opened up while she was there, and so she replaced them with women. And the men, six months later, came to her and thanked her because she had removed this aggressive, need to prove each other type of atmosphere from the conversation, and they could all relax and just focus on doing the good job, mm -hmm. rather than on what position and who had what opportunity to say what. The hierarchy, the classic male hi hierarchy dissipated mm -hmm. as a result of that. So she knows there are also men out there that, and, and I would say, in all honesty, I think it's the majority that would prefer that kind of working environment. They just don't have it enough. And the more women are up there, the more we can change it. In the pharmaceutical uh, field, you were telling me that it is also important for research, science, because... God, yes. Yeah, that's an Im Im important so point you uh, made if you, earlier well, on. So I can, I mean, I can, I can talk statistics all day, but a couple of examples would be, you know, out of um, 10 drugs that are removed from the market, uh, it's often eight of them are because of side effects in women uh, that were not discovered during the clinical trial phase, and that's because there are not enough women in clinical trials. We, a lot of, the, I mean, we basically went from. Some of you may have heard, if not remember, um, the thalidomide story, where there were a lot of um, uh, th there was a drug on the market that was taken by women who were actually pregnant, and it physically uh, did damage the, the fetus, and therefore they were born without arms, without legs, mm -hmm. and so on. And this was a, a reason for the regulators, particularly, to put up some really big barriers to treating women who might be pregnant. And what the pharmaceutical industry did as a result was say, okay, we don't test any drugs in women of childbearing age. So a large portion of our society have not been in clinical trials for the majority of the drugs that are on the market today. Mm. So we are treated with stronger doses, two strong doses. You know, it's, it's funny because in the animal, you know, in the preclinical work that has to be done before you take a drug to humans, they are also, uh, you know, they test some in, in uh, pregnant mice or pregnant rats to see if there's an infect. But we don't do that um, mm. in, in, in humans. So that's the only testing that, that gets done. And I think we, we have a, a huge missed opportunity. The other problem is, let's look at what kills women more than anybody else. Uh, heart disease, a woman's mm. heart attack is not what you think it is. It's not diagnosed It's not properly. the same as a male heart attack. So women get given anxiety pills and sent home undiagnosed and they die. And they die in large numbers. It's an unmet need, right? Research has only, I mean, it's like 30 or 40 years behind male research. Well, because this, men have been topic. interested only in men. Where, um, you know, let, you know where does... Viagra. Viagra mm. is sold for erectile dysfunction. It was originally being tested for severe pain. Pain that is also um, uh, felt by many women during uh, menstrual cycles. That was one of the original therapeutic ideas behind mm. Viagra. And what happened? They found this side effect in men because the pills weren't being sent back at the end of the clinical trial. Um, the leftover ones were being kept by the men. Why is this? They investigated, and that's what they discovered. Oh, so that's what we'll sell it for. And pain and everything just got dropped. Mm. Breast cancer. I saw a, a pink... Uh, the breast cancer November now month. kills fewer women than lung cancer. But we still collect for breast cancer. 
Why? Because it has a fantastic lobby and, you know, breasts are important, right? But so are lungs and we don't have the lobby for that either. Mm. So there is a lot of research that's not done into uh, endometriosis. On average, mm. takes seven to eight years for a woman to be diagnosed with endometriosis. Mm. Why is that? There's not taught enough about it. it you know, there's, there are so many issues. We need women in science because we need women to start researching what has not been researched so far. We need drugs that service our needs as well as, uh, as the men. Mm. Um, and, and that's why I've seen some really great um, uh, uh, activities, Tech for Ava, that's doing a lot now in trying to highlight women's needs, uh, female technologies that support us in all sorts of ways. And I think that's really, really important that we continue to do that, but we need women. We need women in IT for AI because of the biases that are inherent in, in, AI, in AI, because they're programmed by a very large mm. male population mm. and not, not so much the females. I mean, look, these are issues that we've touched on in a little bit already today, right. but, but these are things that concern me and, and should concern all of us. Pia, any comments on what you've heard from Trudy? No, uh, I would say that I support everything <laughs> that has been said. And I also, I can really regard the things that are, because I think that technology is actually one of the most important solutions we have for taking care of the, of the challenges that we have in the world today globally regarding both, um, uh, both climate change and also, of course, uh, digitalization as a possibility. And we have to have system perspectives on the, on the solutions. Mm. And in order to be able to have that, we have to have diversity. Otherwise, the solutions won't be good. So I totally agree with that. Uh, and also, of course, regarding these different types of, of studies that are done mm. on a very small population and not uh, you, you can't really say that you have the whole picture. But for me, it's about having, if we, if we are going to create a better world, we need diversity. We need different perspectives coming in uh, to, to find, because you can have a very narrow perspective on, on some of the system solutions that we're putting up regarding energy or how you build houses or how you build cities or whatever. And you really need to have so many different things coming into these decisions. And they are taken for the moment because this is going on right now. And we can't, and I can't say enough regarding AI and those biased solution systems that are created there. Hmm. It's, I, I would say it's really dangerous, actually. Hmm. Pia Sandvik, thank you ever so much. It was great speaking to you. Thank you, Trudy. Thank you. Hemily. Uh, round of applause for these two women. Yes, definitely. Good job. So I will now invite all our guests, all our speakers to join me on stage uh, for this final panel. And after you'll be able to use the Slido system again for your questions and comments and we'll have a, bit, a q and a session. Jocelyn, would you mind sitting here? I think we have Alexandre here, here Patricia and John. That's the way it has. And I'm just going to take my phone for time control. Oh, not to add, uh, and the, I no, the iPod is more. Time is perfect. Great. There we are. So that is for the questions. Um, OK, we're, we're going to explore. We're going to brainstorm uh, and try and put on the table some solutions to improve diversity. We've heard quite a lot of uh, uh, solutions and, and uh, uh, key success factors, uh, notably from, from Patricia. Um, well, actually, I'll start with you, Patricia. You put forward the importance of mentors, and we've heard that uh, from Pia as well. Um, what, do, what do you think? Probably you, you could react, Roslyn Belburn, on, on, on mentors. Is this system now that is uh, uh, more common in the university environment, the idea that uh, you need a mentor, and when you're a woman, you would need a woman mentor? It's probably more common, but that's starting from zero. Yeah. Um, 
the idea that a woman should have a woman mentor in physics, there aren't enough women to do that. Mm. So it, it's not going to mm. uh, be achievable. It's probably a good goal. Uh, the risk is that the few senior women that there are are mentoring, mentoring, mm. mentoring, mentoring, mm. mentoring. But, but it could work with a male mentor. Uh, or not? Yes, if if there's men and men. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. I think we've, we've yeah. defined two categories. And talking we'll as a on one. Talking as a physicist. You see. Yes, yes. <laughs> but when you when you have decided to create that fund uh, yeah. for for the for the young researchers, there is a bit of that idea too behind it. Is it mentorship? Is it you uh, wanting? A group of well, more women in research. That's that's what you're aiming mm -hmm. at, of more, course. More diversity in research. Mm. Yes. So not only women. What do you have a larger definition of diversity? Anything other than white male. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Mentorship, Alexandre. Yes. Pasha, how important that is, is, is that? I think it is important for both men and women, by the way, in companies, because mm -hmm. we have a lot of talent of both genders that need to be promoted, that needs to be helped, yeah. supported, mm. uh, and especially, for, of course, for women as well. But I would, uh, for sure, uh, encourage to have it for all talented people. And then for, for talented uh, women, uh, then, of course, uh, it's, it's important, as you said, to find the right context, to find mm. the right mentors that are helping them, not just on the talent part, but also on the uh, the whole diversity aspects to make sure that mm. they are in a fertile ground mm -hmm. uh, and can grow in the best mm -hmm. possible conditions. Mm. Patricia, you have to train mentors because it's a bit of a culture that you have to bring in the in the company. No, it's 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 not a traditional conservative way of management. Well, I I, I think it. Um, I always say we cannot fix the women, we have to fix the system, right? And what I yes. mean with that yes. is we have to put in place certain structures that fosters that environment. Mentorship can be one of it. I mean, it can be one tool that we have in companies and organizations at universities to really do that. And yes, obviously we have to, I wouldn't say teach, I mean, the mentors are all um, you know, highly qualified people, but yes, we have to kind of uh, uh, give them some insight insights about what is expected, mm -hmm. but at the mm -hmm. end of the day, the mentee is in the driver's seat, but the mentor actually gets something out of it as well. It is a two-way street. Mm -hmm. So um, we, in our programs, um, promote mentorship heavily, and the feedbacks that we get from the mentors um, are out I mean, outstanding because they really love it. What they hear from the young um, female leaders, you know, they can actually learn from them as well. It is really also kind of giving back, but getting something as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think, yes, we have to talk to them before, but more about kind of uh, um, setting the expectations straight and, and, and give a good uh, environment so that uh, that mentorship can, uh, can thrive. Mm. Mm -hmm. Throughout the afternoon, we realized how stereotypes, biases are uh, really the enemy uh, at all kinds of levels. John, you, you, you were talking about the, those stereotypes with incredible figures that you data you showed us. Um, you, you, you said that you wanted to talk about estimate causal effect on diversity. What did you mean by that? Um, what I meant is that uh, a lot of consulting companies have put out data that are actually false and have misled consumers of this data. So typically what they do is they correlate proportion of women on boards with how profitable the company is. And that, and that correlation can be explained by omitted causes. For example, firm size um, um, uh, or other kinds of factors. Um, so the, the data are not that clear about diversity per se having a causal impact on profitability of firms. Um, and there's a lot of work in economics, in financial economics, that show, in general, uh, if I need to summarize the results, that there is no effect. What's important is you get good people in those positions. So, you know, if we keep hiring good white male scientists, um, you know, you, you might have uh, co 
go, you might go in some way or, or other that might not be the right way. And I agree very much with what um, Joycelyn said. If you have diversity of thought, um, you, will, you will find new solutions and, and things like that in science. So for example, if, if people all come from the same production, you know, I don't know, the oxen bridge uh, model, um, they, they're gonna come with similar ideas. Mm -hmm. um, in our field, we see that diversity of experiences, which may be correlated with sex or not, or age or mm -hmm. not, or ethnicity or not, diversity of experience is much more important than simply diversity on, on, on observables like sex. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, at the end of the day, what, what, if we have systems that are objective, I think the, it will give equal opportunities to male and females. And, and I'm actually working on that now with AI, because we know that if AI is trained by humans, it can reproduce the biases. So one way we're getting away from that is by objectively measuring, for example, personality or achievements or something like that in, in women and men, mm -hmm. then asking to present themselves in a simulated interview, and then have humans rate them. Have I a, uh, AI um, code objectively how they are? And our idea is to try to eliminate bias by using um, artificial intelligence systems to give you equal opportunity to all. Um, and then the only study that I know that has a, a good causal estimate is from Norway, where they looked when there was a, a, a legislative um, fiat that you have to have a certain percentage of women on the, on the, on the boards. And yes. they compared firms um, in Norway to Sweden and countries that are very similar and with very similar um, uh, portfolio of companies. And they looked at the trends to make sure that these companies had very similar previous performance. And then they see what happens when you put an exogenous shock and put more females on, on companies. Mm. And what they found was there, was there was no effect, really. In some companies, the, there was less profitability. But the good news was there were less firings when, uh, when, the, when the cycles of business went down. So they're still studying what's happening in the long term. Mm -hmm. So we don't quite know. So, so I think we, we, we don't quite know what we're gaining. Exactly. We don't quite know. In the, an yeah. economic. Yeah, so uh, that's it. It's just that the consulting data are not good right now. And, mm -hmm. and, and statisticians know that. So we, we're trying to figure out ways to, to, to mm. redress that. But what's the best way to convince a manager or a, a company uh, that he should hire yeah. a woman? Well, sh show them the data, show them it's unfair, show them that a less competent man or someone uh, or men have it easier and that oftentimes we overlook competent females. Now, we may have sufficient white guys to fill the, 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 the slots now, but the demographics are changing and we're certainly not gonna have enough people. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, if the system is objective, I think it will be equally likely to hire male or female. And we need to promote more women in, in STEM and mentor them. And you know, men and women are to blame. I, in one experiment, I didn't mention it, but you know, you know the one with the anger experiment? If you measure the sex of the person who's doing the rating, it's irrelevant. Yep. In all experiments we do, yep. males and females act exactly the same yep. way mm -hmm. as yep. a function of cultural context. Yep. So when males are sexist, so are females. Yep. So you know, this is not a problem no, only. That's the, the notion of culture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. That would be exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Social difficulty. conditioning. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. It, yes, what's, yeah. what's yeah. the solution? <laughs> What's the no, but I wanted to get back to that because it, I it is a, um, a cultural factor. Take an example of, of coding programmers, right? Here in Switzerland, I mean, what comes to, to your mind? Coding men, right? Yep. Go to India, all the women mm -hmm. actually are programming there, not the men. Mm -hmm. So it is a cultural issue, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think we, it helps to have like different perspectives from different cultures and to mingle. And coming back to, to the business case of gender diversity or diversity in general, I'm a little bit sick of that, you know? Because it's not only a business um, case, it's, it's, a, it's a societal Society case, case, you know? I mean, um, if we, if we think about it, and, and Pia said that, we bring out better solutions. I mean, we heard about the medical studies. Uh, you can go on in AI and the um, automated application systems that has been programmed. You heard the Amazon case. All of you have read that. The, cra the crash uh, car dummies. Um, and then also, for instance, um, Alexas of these worlds, you know, they recognize female voices um, uh, just not uh, as, as uh, good as the, as the male voices. Mm -hmm. And this has to do because they are only men that were programming that. So at the end of the day, I think it, it makes the society a better place to live in. Mm -hmm. So we cannot mm -hmm. just always point out to the business case. Um, mm -hmm. There's an regards. ethical case to it. Mm -hmm. it. It is a way of making society better in a philosophical way. 
to promote diversity in science and in other on the workplace. I think so, yes. Yeah, yes. you believe that. And it makes more opportunities for the women yep. mm. who in past times, you know, were shunted into the kitchen. Mm. Do, do women, do they research, do they do research differently than men? Would physics be different if there were more women doing I'm, it? I'm not sure about that. I don't, mm. I don't actually know. Um, we'll probably measure that later on, of course, when we have more women when there in are the more women. field. But, uh, it's not obvious to me that that's the case, but then the few women that there are have been trained by men, mostly. Yeah. Mm. So maybe we need to wait for mm. a few generations before we can mm. answer that one. Let's go back to solutions. Uh, Alexandre Shah, if, if there's one solution, we've heard quite a lot of uh, uh, solutions this afternoon that you would like to, uh, that you, you know, that strikes you, then you feel that that should be a priority. What would it be? Uh, in my view, in the stems. In stems, in my view, it's really in schools that we should uh, be pushing a lot more. Yes. Uh, the to, interest to, for the interest for, for, girls for, for, for into science, for technology, for mm -hmm. also giving uh, concrete examples of how technology is improving our lives, uh, so as to interest uh, the whole population and not just uh, the, you know the. Uh, the mm. male, I mean, it was to me a shock when you saw this, um, I forgot the name of that uh, thing on TV there, where you had a physicist, you had the engineer, you had uh, five or f four or five guys, and then you had one lady in the, in the plot, and she was a waitress, right? Mm. Yeah. And then yeah. in the end, uh, this is a very poor e example that we're giving to, mm -hmm. to the audience, mm -hmm. and I think I would love to see more movies yes. and other things uh, where we see uh, brilliant uh, scientists, female scientists, and brilliant uh, female engineers mm -hmm. working alongside uh, brilliant mm -hmm. uh, male engineers, mm -hmm. uh, that our girls can see that they have a future in that uh, direction. Mm -hmm. And then it's so going back me, to it, role model, yeah. Yes, so yes. to me, it's really in schools that we should be starting doing a lot more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Schools, who would agree? Absolutely, you, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Also for boys, in the sense of, um, you know, I mean, I have two, they're now in their early 20s. One of them knits, uh, they both learned to patchwork from my mother. Um, you know, they, they both cook fantastically well, way better than I do. Um, maybe because I don't cook very well, I don't know. Mm. Could be desperation, but they love cooking. Mm. And they love cooking well. And one of them has always kind of pushed to do stuff, whatever he felt like doing, and he didn't care whether it was something that was considered male or female, he just loved it. Mm -hmm. um, and yet they've both done military service and they're all, you know, they love that kind of stuff too. So, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, why can't you try anything that you feel mm -hmm. like doing? And, and the boys need to know that it's okay to also do home economics. Who talked mm -hmm. about home economics yeah. earlier, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. why, why can't you do home economics as a boy? I mean, yes. you know, mm -hmm. my kids loved it. I mean, fortunately, mm -hmm. by the time my kids were in school, you could then, you had to do yeah. both. You had Handwerken mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. had, uh, mm -hmm. you know, home economic stuff. Just John. If I may say a small point, uh, uh, my, my ex-wife, uh, she's also a professor, and I made it as a point to stay at home two days a week and, you know, take my girl. I have two girls, by the way, as well. And your theory. <laughs> <laughs> my theory's working. Um, yeah, in, in the judicial system in America, uh, people with two, um, elected officials with two girls are much more um, pro-women uh, issues and, uh, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. CEOs with also two girls. CEOs. <laughs> yeah, CEOs, they've done studies. And that's a, that's a kind of random experiment because whether you have a girl or mm. boy, it's randomly given by nature. Mm, yeah. uh, but, but I stayed at home two days a week. I took them to, to school, brought them back, made lunch. I did the cleaning, bathrooms, and the, the really not nice jobs were my job. And I did it on purpose so that my girls could see a, um, a, a high-status male doing mm -hmm. jobs like that and cooking. Yeah. I love cooking. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I, you know, I did a lot of fun activities with my girls growing up. So when they grow up also, they're going to hold men to a different standard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, guys as well are, are part of the solution. Um, yeah. I, I had lunch with David, uh, with uh, Michael Miller of UNOG. He was director of UNOG, and, and he never took any speaking uh, assignment unless it was a balanced panel. Uh, you know, he was a very strong gender champion. And, mm -hmm. and I think that the solution to this, not just women who, who are fighting, but men who join the effort, gender champions who mm -hmm. are there to help and show this is the moral mm -hmm. thing to do, it's the ethical yes. thing to do. In the long run, I'm 100% sure there's going to be a strong business case for it, even mm -hmm. though the data right now are not so co conclusive. Mm -hmm. But men need to be good role models yeah. and also help mentor and develop women. Because as, as mm -hmm. you said, um, Joycelyn, they're not perhaps enough 
enough women in astronomy now, so men have to mm. pick up the slack and yep. become more um, uh, aware and more sensitive to these issues. Mm -hmm. and, and well, it seems yeah. obvious as well that uh, we're going towards diversity, men and women hand in hand. Mm. Uh, yes. it, it will be yes. more efficient. That, that way. You were mentioning the, uh, the, the presidents of the, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I forgot his name, the one that had his uh, wife that was also an astronomer and promoted women. Well, God, yes. yes. D has that changed now in physics? Do you think there's a more conscious uh, amongst male that uh, there is a bias and that we could do something about it? Yes, and what has driven it is interesting, um, and it's something we haven't mentioned. Um, one of the things I did at one point was meeting with, after work, at our own expense, with some other senior women from various bits of science, saying, what can we do to improve the gender balance in science in UK universities? And one of us, who is a bit more of a psychologist than the rest of us, said, hmm, you know, university presidents are competitive guys. If we create a prize for the most woman-friendly university, they'll compete. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, we were poor. We could only afford a glass rose bowl. But she was right, right. We announced the competition, and they competed, and we awarded the rose bowl. We did it again the next year. More universities applied. <laughs> Mm. And that gradually got taken over and became a, quite a big scheme called the Athena Swan Scheme. Um, then moved to arts faculties where the question is, where are the men, not where are the women? Um, got backed by grant-giving bodies, and that's the real crux. If the funders insist on diversity, it'll happen yeah. tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If the funders don't care, Nobody cares. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So go to the funding bodies and convince them of the importance of diversity. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any comments on well, that? Well, I'd just add that the lady who, who uh, you know, was been uh, last 40 years working on mRNA technology often didn't get the funds and had to fight and find out to scrimp through somehow yes. to be able to do the research that's given us these fantastic new, new technology yeah. vaccines. Yeah. I mean, but again, yeah. grants not there, funding not there, yeah. you know, yeah. constantly having to fight more yeah. than anybody else to get the money. Mm. Yeah. Incentives. I just want to say with regards to uh, funding and the money, I mean, we do know that money rules the world. And when we look at stock listed companies, um, I really like BlackRock's model because they decided not to invest in companies anymore if there's not at least a third of the uh, mm. leadership women. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, well, that's only the stock listed companies. But um, mm. I feel that comparing to what you just said, you know, those companies, they have then really an, a motivation to drive mm. that. Yes. Mm. And they do it because they have to, because they don't want to be off the list of black mm -hmm. work, right? Yeah, it can become a marketing asset exactly. as well, can't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. To have more women. Would I make a comment? Uh, on PR? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Sorry, thank you. you. I was thinking <laughs> about the possibility to do, uh, to recruiting, because I can see at KTH, uh, regarding Masters of Engineering programs, we have 30% female students coming into the system. And it's as high as that, that because we have architecture and design as well in these programs. And I think it's really important. We have to start in the educational system, as has been said already. Mm -hmm. And I think that we also have to sort of describe these occupations in a different way than we yes. do today. Yeah. Because for me, it's about making the world better. Yeah. And you don't communicate that. And these educations always start with math. Mm -hmm. You make one year of math. I was myself a mathematician before I became an engineer because I realized that the engineers will get the better jobs. <laughs> so I only went, did one year of mathematics. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to sort of describe what difference you can make towards the challenges that we have today. And that was also mentioned in the panel just a, a, a few minutes ago. I think that's very important. And I also think that there's a tipping point regarding organizations, because if you just have a few females, you will adapt the culture, yeah. because, because otherwise you won't survive. Mm -hmm. So you need to have a tipping point where you have, not perhaps balance, but, but at least 30 to 30, 70 or something like that. Then I think things will change, because otherwise, if you have one woman 
in a board of directors or in a, or in a management team, she will sort of be the the legitimacy of having some new perspectives and it you won't <laughs> she will be have able to, to act like a man to survive that, exactly yes. so going back to what you were yes. saying as well yeah. Yeah. Patricia exactly or she's the so i really think we yeah. have to work with the educational system because that's mm -hmm. where it really starts and mm -hmm. there i would say that the educational system today not in sweden and not in many places at all are doing as good as we can expect. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we, we actually have a question uh, from the from the audience on that young girls are afraid to answer questions in STEM subjects uh, in gymnasium students when they, they, they asked in a survey, how can we change that? We don't have a definite answer, but we realize that there is some deconstruction. No, but we can change that. I mean, honestly, I mean, I feel the schools do a terrible job with regard to that. We, we talked about that in the break. A lot of the girls, including mine, um, were really good at math. And then they go into the uh, high school, and all of a sudden, they were not praised enough anymore like the boys were. Mm -hmm. Like, it was, was really stereotypical. It was very biased. No, so, so, and then all of a sudden, just coming home, I don't think I'm good at math. And I'm like, what? You're as good as anyone. So I just feel also their um, male teachers need to become allies, you know, mm. to really uh, Ooh, make that visible. Female teachers and too. And females as well. Yeah. You're absolutely because, right. Because, I mean, everybody's biased, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, you're absolutely yeah. right. So, yeah, I, I had the advantage, maybe just to yes, throw please, in here, because when, when, I, when I went to high school, basically from the age of 11, until 16, I was in an all-girls school. Mm. Secondary mm -hmm. school, all girls. Mm -hmm. So there were only girls in the class, mm -hmm. and I loved math, and it was my favorite topic. Yeah. And we were in competition with each other for who would be the best, and we were not afraid, not mm -hmm. afraid to ask questions, mm -hmm. not afraid to be, to be competitive. Mm -hmm. The moment at 16, when the boys came in, it all went quiet. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and there's been a big debate uh, on that because yeah. some sur yeah. well, some I, studies were me, saying the, the, that we should yeah. separate boys and girls, and of course, then you're thinking, oh wow, well, that's not the model we want for society. I so agree, what do we do? But, but they did perform better, I think. Mm -hmm. That's the result of the the, yeah. the study when girls were yeah. on without uh, mm -hmm. boys yeah. in mathematics. But we, we mean now we need to change education because we need to promote science for girls as well, as mm. we do for men. And we need to Could change the bias. Question? Sorry? Pia. Uh, sorry, okay. Pia, no, please. But I was just going to say, and we need to change the, 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 the bias of the teachers, the yes. teachers that believe, yeah, who believe, sorry, that uh, boys are better at maths than girls. Yeah. Pia. But I have a comment regarding, I'm a little bit slow since I'm <laughs> regarding mentorship as well, because I don't think that it's always necessary, as you all said, uh, that you need, you as a female need a, a, a female mentor. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's very valuable to have a male mentor as well, and, yeah. and you can have an internal mentor as well mm -hmm. in order to understand the system. Where are the solutions, yes. and the structures within a company True. or within academia? Where are the solutions taken? Where are the decisions taken? How are the structures in order to be able to sort of bring things on the table? And all sort of that stuff, because otherwise you can be very lonely and you don't really understand how to get the things done, actually. Yeah. Mm. And then you could be stopped in your career just due to that. So I think it be, could be important. I don't think we should sort of. I, you have you can you can have both female and male mentors, and you can have them externally and internally depending on what you want to want to achieve. Actually, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we have another interesting question uh, from the audience. There's a known bias about applying to a job. Women are not applying if they are missing just one skill in the job description. Men are applying if they just have a, a few of the listed skills. How to change that? Uh, you mentioned something similar as well, Angel mm -hmm. on, on that matter, male being very confident and mm -hmm. not having to, to mm -hmm. prove anything, and uh, women on the contrary. How do we change that, Alexandre? Well, for sure, the way we describe the job description, the way we write the job descriptions, there we can make small tweaks and changes so that uh, we, we state exactly that, that you know, it's, mm -hmm. we're looking for someone that meets some of those criteria, not all of the criteria, and maybe uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. formulate the job descriptions in a way that makes it sexier for, for both genders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And also maybe to point out what are must-have criteria yes. and what are nice-to-have criteria. Yes. Yeah. Because obviously everybody wants to have must-have criteria, but it's, in, it's just who, who is perfect, right? And we do know that women do not apply uh, if they cannot fit all the must-have mm -hmm. criteria. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think you have to 
be very specific there. And you pointed out the language as well, right? Yeah, in the, the chakra uh, descriptions. Yeah. Inclusive and it's, it's language. Like inclusive in language, but not only the, the title, but really the also the typing. adjectives, you know, the that you use. Yeah. If you only say strong and ambitious and, you know, mm -hmm. um, then you actually turn off the women, they, yeah, they yeah. do not mm -hmm. apply. Yeah. There's John. one small thing I wanted to say. In promotions, there, there's a paper we just uh, accepted that had been picked up a lot by the media. We looked at opt-in versus opt-out mechanisms. And, and uh, so they, the behavioral economists created a game where they measured the ability of everyone. They made it known to everyone. And then you could opt-in or opt-out to lead the group and then get mm -hmm. better payoffs. So when men are good, they propose themselves. Women propose themselves left often, even when they're demonstrably good. So they switched around the mechanism and they said okay we're gonna take all the good ones and you're in you got to opt out now so you know it's it's akin to going out and saying we're gonna consider you for promotion unless you don't want to be considered mm -hmm. so you know we find the guy the good people we say you're in the pool unless you want to opt out yeah. so that's one mechanism that seems to uh, redre uh, redress some of the problems yeah. so uh, just google opt-in opt-out leadership and you'll mm -hmm. come across the paper we just accepted it mm -hmm. a few weeks ago it's mm -hmm. a really great paper mm -hmm. and uh, because women naturally will not yep. propose themselves yep. as often as men yep. will even if they know they're good. Mm -hmm. But it's the imposter syndrome. That's yes. probably why they don't. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe. We're going one back to reasons. Oh, yeah. or, or just one the conditioning the that we give girls and young women. Mm. Yeah. Got to go look look for them. Yeah. And, and I just want to make a case in point. You remember our rector, Dominic Arleta? Yes. He, he was the last male rector we had, and we have a female rector now. Since 1537, we didn't have a female rector at our university in Lausanne. Since 1537, mm -hmm. he opened up the way because he's a, he was a gender champion. He appointed someone for diversity and inclusion, and then the, the terrain was, was set. In, in HSE, the faculty, 100 years, we didn't have a female dean. Mm -hmm. And then Suzanne de Treville, um, she became the first male dean, female dean. I, 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 I also was on her team, and I, I did it to, to really help the effort. And, and I think guys, are the ones who, are, who have power now. They are the key. Okay. We've got to recruit them, not isolate them, not make them feel like they are the perpetrators of huge crimes. We've got to convince them one by one, the super powerful mm. men, mm. they're yeah. the ones that hand can in help. Hand to change the, yeah. the, the culture. It's going, one question, do women leaders also have a negative bias towards women? So yes, it can happen, of course, can. because yes. of course. Uh? it can. Yeah. Mm. Not, not automatically, but mm -hmm. anybody can have a bias against anybody. Mm -hmm. But because there's a, a, a dom male dominating culture and you probably feel as even as a woman when you reach power you have to have that kind of uh, uh, attitude towards other women. How, it, how does it work? Well, we did a research in, in St. Gallen and, and it, it came back to the Queen Bee effect that this uh, absolutely yeah. does not exist. It has to do with majority and minority in the workplace because we did the same study also with foreigners and Swiss. So basically, when it comes to evaluation processes and promotion um, processes, mm -hmm. those who are in the majority um, they actually evaluate um, quite nicely um, mm. others that are in the majority. But if you're in the minority, for instance, you're the, the only woman on a leadership team and you have to evaluate another woman who is in the minority, obviously, then you evaluate that woman quite heavily. And that is, con I mean, um, meant to be a queen bee effect, which is not because it has nothing to do with gender. It has to do with who is in the minority and who is in the majority. Mm -hmm. That's something you've seen as well, Trudy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I mentioned about once you've got a, a mix in there, it, it, everybody can kind of relax from being this, yes, you know, yeah, exactly. and not, not assimilating with each other, exactly. but actually let go and be inclusive. And, and, yeah. and that's something that a lot of men want too. Mm -hmm. mm. May I add a small point about um, selection panels? They did a study in Spain and Italy where they randomly appoint panels for promotion. And interestingly, they didn't care so much about gender proportions. And when suddenly there were more females in selection panels than males, especially in STEM, men became more hostile in rating women, because I think all of a sudden they felt, what the hell's happening here? You know, now there are more women. Um, and um, uh, so, you know, uh, uh, we got to figure out a way to not isolate men, yeah. because they, they are getting really paranoid, you know, yes. going around, if, yeah. you know, you all the time you call, yeah. you know, white male, whatever, yeah. you know, yeah, 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 yeah. after a while, I mean, you know, it, it bothers me a little bit after a while, because you know, I'm a, I'm a strong gender champion, but, but the, the guys who don't know about it, we isolate them even more. Mm. So we need to figure out ways to speak to this. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point, Alexandre. Yeah. 
Yes, Something up. I've noticed at CSCM, so we said that for equal files, when we hire someone, we will favor a woman. So I've said that. And then, then I had some male colleagues saying, oh, look, uh, what's going to happen with us? I mean, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. going to be a problem for male now. Are we going to be <laughs> yeah. suffering yeah. from inequality? Yeah. 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 And then just told them, look, uh, our female colleagues had to suffer that for, exactly. for years and years. So exactly. it's about <laughs> time. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome but to the club. <laughs> <laughs> club. But I mean, all of a sudden and it, it became a, a threat. And, and all of a sudden it became mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, unfair to them. Yeah. Because we, we said that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. You can still uh, use the, the slide to put some uh, questions through. I don't, don't uh, hesitate. Um, there's one question about how do you view the impact uh, in recruitment in Switzerland when you add name, photo, gender, marital status, children, etc., on CVs? Uh, what I understand is what, what you should, probably shouldn't say uh, to make <laughs> your chances better. <laughs> Patricia, or who would like to answer by that, John? Well, that's why we're using a, we're developing AI uh, methods now to go beyond that. Because, you know, you put a photo on there, yeah, immediately biases. If you're yeah. more symmetrical, more pretty, immediately biases. Everything biases. And not biases. only gender, you said. Yeah. Age, age, the way you look, yeah. the way, yeah. yeah if but you're Mohammed or John, hair, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, Mohammed, the psychologist, is not going to get as many jobs as John, the psychologist. Mm -hmm. But know? I hope you have a diverse pool of people who is influencing that AI, right? Because if we only have middle-aged white yes, men yes, programming yes. that AI, we actually accelerate the bias. No, but that, that's <laughs> not true. On it depends on what is, the program is is, 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 it depends on how it is done. So I do agree about all those problems that happen. But if you have a diverse pool of people and you objectively identify the characteristics, exactly. and then um, uh, you know, say this is an intelligent woman, so, you know, uh, exactly. Yeah. So it exactly. depends on how it's done. No, I, it's, it's yeah, about, yeah. it's about the data, I need right? To reproduce another bias. Yeah, of course. That's what, what I mean. If the I men mean. are selecting, then it's going to create. Well, a problem. Only, 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 pro only promote men with daughters. Sorry? Yeah, exactly. That would be helpful. Yeah, Only your boys, by the way, influenced you. You said A to Z and not A to Z. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Belvernel, you wanted to uh, yes. add something on that yes. matter. Yes. There's mm -hmm. been concern, particularly in the United States, about the allocation of telescope time for astronomers. The women weren't doing too well. And for Hubble Space Telescope, they have now instituted what they call a double-blind assessment. Ah. Um, your personal particulars are on a sheet that is separated from the case you make. And as a consequence of that, the fraction of females getting telescope time has risen dramatically. Wow. So maybe more recruitment needs to have yeah. the page mm -hmm. of personal details removed. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. There's a lot that can be done uh, yeah. in, in mm -hmm. management, yeah. in recruitment, yeah. 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 HR, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Alexandre. Yeah. I mean, that's true for the first steps, but then, of course, you will be meeting the, the person face to yes. face. Yeah. And then yes. At one point, and it then gets, boom, yes. the, the, yeah. the biases are back. But you so, still have so a, I think a, it helps a, a in, the, in the initial though. processes, but it's not enough. What I'm saying is, yes. it helps. Uh, necessary but not sufficient because then you will still have a panel of mm -hmm. uh, finalists that you will meet. And if you have a biased um, pool of people assessing them, mm. then, then you still end up yeah. with the same outcome. Yeah. But, but you I think not, as, I, not the same, because the pool you're interviewing has a much higher fraction of females. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, yes. True. Yeah. Yes. You have got, you got a bit, you get and you have chance. to make sure that you have standardized interviews, you know, that you always yes. say, ask the same questions the same. in the same order, because otherwise you will fall into the confirmation bias, you will fall into the mm -hmm. yeah. um, similarity attraction bias, okay. you will fall into the double standard uh, gender mm -hmm. bias. All those biases, they just happen, you know, it's yeah. just normal. So if you can tweak the system a little bit with standardized interviews, then you can actually overcome that. Yeah. And I always um, really advocate also to have two people in the room, mm -hmm. if possible, two diverse people in the room, and not yes. just gender diverse people, who make the assessment and then also uh, make the selection. Because mm -hmm. That really helps. Even more than two, even five. Yeah. If well, but, uh, well, but that, you know, in the business really nice world, the they will never I allocate. Mean, I would like to be sat in front of five people. Exactly. <laughs> but, 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 but it's what happens in academia. 
But it does yes, happen. Yes, I know. Yes, yeah. true. It, it does happen, and the <gasps> grades from five people are more accurate than one person or two persons. That's, That's true. a fact. Mm. So it, it, fact. it can happen. So Some companies should. can do it. It's difficult, but it yes. happens. Mm. And another thing I wanted to add about the testosterone, we did a study, <laughs> and we measured testosterone on people, and we made them play te dictator games where they had a pool of resources. Mm -hmm. And then the more power we gave them, and the more testosterone they had, the more they stole. This is a fact. So, you know, people ask me, so what's the conclusion? I said, well, easy, snip, snip. <laughs> <laughs> or hire more women. Yeah. <laughs> what do you prefer? <laughs> <laughs> there you've got the, the leather. <laughs> yeah, okay, let's not do that. <laughs> Pia, on recruitment, any comments on your side? On, on, on recruitment, the biases when we recruit women? What efforts can be made? Uh, now, I think most of the things have been said already yeah. that you really have to be careful and transparent and use the same type of criteria, the same type of questions. Uh, and I think it's that's really important. It doesn't matter if it's in academia or if it's in if it's in business. But I have another thing that I would like to add to the discussion, and that is regarding how to sort of getting new things to happen i think it's really important that we have a it has been that we have a balance between managers or leaders as well because mm -hmm. if we don't have any females as leaders it won't nothing mm -hmm. will happen so i think when once we become became become leaders we have a responsibility that that is quite large i think to really promote women as well mm -hmm. uh, to take leadership positions because mm -hmm. otherwise it will be status quo i would say mm -hmm. there was also a question about uh, women uh, funding launching startups uh, that the the figures are bad uh, there's not a lot of women uh, yeah, the, there's, there's something like, um, I don't know, 7% uh, at the most women leading startups. Um, most of them have, uh, in Switzerland at least, some form of foreign background. So either they came from outside of Switzerland to do a PhD, um, or they have at least one parent that's from uh, a different country. So they have a different um, set of criteria when they're growing up um, and different expectations placed on them, to go back to a point I made mm. earlier. Um, but, but something like only 2% of, of the financing um, or 2% of the, of the investors are women. Uh, and therefore, uh, the, the amount of investment that goes to women founders is much lower yeah. than to um, male um, founders, mm -hmm. uh, both all male teams and mixed teams. So women uh, CEOs are, are not perceived in the same way that, that male CEOs yeah. are. And yet, uh, to go back to something that was mentioned earlier, the, the quality is usually obviously the highest uh, in that group because they've had to fight and, and do so much cool mm -hmm. stuff. So the ones that do succeed are the, probably the best the of the best. best. Yeah. Um, and yeah. actually deserve the money more than more than some of the guys. Um, so is I, there, I, it is, is there, a problem. Is there a double challenge, like for startups in STEMs? Because uh, firstly, uh, women are not so attracted to technical to the technical field, and then there's the problem of lack of confidence in taking very you know high positions, uh, powerful. You, that's going back to the, the glass ceiling and all that. Is yeah. there, is there two challenges we need to solve? I, I think regarding startups yeah, and there, STEMs, there are there are multiple. I mean, just to speak for one experience. I mean, I go to a lot of events where startups present and they have mm. posters and there are events, uh, and you can talk to to a lot of people. And, and if they've seen you on a panel, you know they'll come up to you afterwards and talk to you about their about their ideas. And, and because I'm a woman, a lot of women come to me. The, the few yes. that there are will come and talk to me. Yeah. And and, and sometimes they have the most fantastic ideas. And I say, well, when are you founding your company? And say, well, I, I still need to find a CEO. Mm. What do you mean you need to find a CEO? <laughs> this is your idea. <laughs> you know, to do it. Find people to work with you. But, you know, there are, there are so many programs yeah. and, and yeah, trainings yeah. and, and mm -hmm. things. Even in Swiss, there's a lot of entrepreneurship training. We have a lot of women go to, to the various modules to, you know, look at their business model and try and develop a business model. But then when it comes to the, the, the module three, which is more around, you know, having a startup and setting it up and then moving forward and growing it, we lose a lot of women. So there are more women in the mm. business plan, sort of business model development, and then when it comes to actually setting it up, we lose them. Where are they going? Why mm. do they decide mm. not, not to keep going? Mm. Right? They so, funding, yeah, it could, yeah. could be funding, right? Yeah. So, so we need more women business uh, angel investors. Yes. Angel investors, <laughs> like Trudy. <Yeah. laughs> 
But Alex, but well, yeah, on the double challenge, yeah, for the yeah. But I think STEM. what we should also back to the um, to the role model thing. Uh, there are some brilliant uh, women CEOs uh, in startups. I recently, I just talked to um, the CEO of uh, Cutius, yeah. this yes. company in Zurich. She has yeah, raised yeah. over 50 million Swiss francs. Uh, and none from VC, because no VC wanted to fund her no. venture. No. Mm -hmm. And she found it through uh, family offices and through per, uh, private investors. Yes. And I think she's absolutely convinced that she will you know, save the life of millions of people. She will. Uh, and she will. Yeah. And I think uh, such models have to be somehow publicized. It has to be mm -hmm. uh, yes. communicated around. And uh, mm -hmm. we have some brilliant uh, women CEOs in startups that can be uh, shown to mm -hmm. To girls, uh, so they are inspired. Yes, mm. yeah. we Absolutely. have to make them visible, you know, yeah. so that uh, and have they to have to go to schools, yeah. they have to go to universities, exactly. so that everybody yes. can see them, you know. Yeah, because but they're also the trying to run a company and get funding. So I mean, like, <laughs> you know, how do you? <laughs> there's not enough of them yet. To yeah, go but around, you know, right? I mean, you have to start somewhere, right? Yeah, so, um, yeah. Uh, um, we'll hire them all as industry coaches afterwards once okay. they've um, had their exits. Yeah. John, you wanted to add a um, word on just that? Just a small point going back to what um, uh, Patricia and said. Certainly the system is much more important to fix, but also women um, can also be given more tools um, in, in how to project themselves, how to project more their personality, their charisma. Um, and we've been doing a lot of experiments exactly on that, trying to show gender balanced or inclusive ways of speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of these very good women CEOs are actually very charismatic and, and, and they're able to convince and project and, and all that. And actually, this is a teachable skill. We do this a lot. I work a lot with the UN in, in promoting women and we only have all women workshops for a whole week. The whole thing is about how to present yourself, how to have better presence, how to speak in front of an audience, mm -hmm. how to convince, and, and also in venture, venture capital um, uh, endeavors. I was mentioning in Northern Ireland, we, we do that mm -hmm. a lot also in, in, with invest in NI to get women to really learn how to project themselves. I, I, Can I um, come back on that? Yes, yep. just lean and then Trudy. Yep. You're telling the women to conform to the male norm. Exactly. No, yeah. no, yes. no. exactly. Yeah. Yes. No. Yeah. Well, you're close yes. to it. Yes. No, no, you no, need no. To watch Be it. because this is not a, it's not a, um, a male stereotypical way of acting. So the, the way that we've conceived it is about you know, being storytelling better, using metaphor better, mm -hmm. talking about values and morals. Men don't do that often, by the way. No. They don't talk Agreed. about that. So it's not, yes. a, it's not promoting a male way of acting. Male way of acting is authoritarian, you know, being aggressive and all that. That's, it's not about that at all. It's a soft means of influence. Um, and it seems to redress the amount of women that can get promoted later on, especially like the UN has all these goals, we want more women, all that stuff. And then you go up and you see at the top of the organization, there's fewer and fewer women. Yeah. And, um, and, and this way, we're trying to get more women to get to the top, and they are. Um, so I, I do I take your point, mm -hmm. but we right. must not make women act like men. That's not yeah. the yeah, point. I've, I've yeah, I've been through enough thing. courses of, for fixing women in the exactly. corporate world, and I'm mm. like, so where is the cause to fix the men? Yeah. To listen to <laughs> yeah. the women, you know, the women voices in the room mm. uh, in a different way than they have been, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we agree on, on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jocelyn, there's a, a, a question I've been asked. Uh, you know how it is nowadays, we like to tweet things, we like mm. to put them on the social media, we want the punchline. Uh, what is your punchline for a young female student in physics nowadays? I would say go for it. Go for it? Go for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just mm. do it. Yep. Mm. Just do it. Get rid of uh, just do fears, it. have confidence and just do it. It may not be easy all the way, but it's worth going for it if that's where your talents lie. Mm. Yeah. I, think, I think maybe there's one topic we've not really touched on so much, but is really important at this point, is about networking. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because women tend to see networking as a nice to have extracurricular activity. Yes. Um, and because they want to focus on their work, they're paid to do work, they want to do good work, they mm -hmm. want to deliver. They um, work a lot. They work very hard, mm. right, to mm -hmm. prove themselves and, you know. So, but what they don't do very well is build naturally networks. They're good at socializing, so they have the capabilities, but they mm -hmm. don't give it the prominent amount of time necessary to build good network relationships right. in the working environment from different places. Mm -hmm. I always saw it as a, as a nice to have. 
um, and for, you know, for a very long time. And it was only later when I left the corporate world where I had very good network internally in, in that company. Um, and then I was out there and suddenly, you you know, you were yes, where's yourself? my network? Yeah. I never paid yes. it attention. Yep. Yes. And, and if there's one thing I would impress, because it also helps to re-socialize yourself a little bit, in a way, is to talk with people, with, with role models you see out there. If you see someone that you think does really well or has the kind of career that you would, you know, you would mm -hmm. like, talk to them. You know, most, most mentors, formal or informal, doesn't have to be a formal program, often have the time to say yes, you know, even if it's only you know, an hour a month or something. Yeah. But yes. if you don't ask, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And that's most the same say yes. in the academic uh, field, the importance of network, Yes, it's usually seen as research networks. Yeah. But mm. uh, yeah. Mm. yeah. I think it's, well. It, well, I want to definitely repeat that and um, emphasize on exposure. Because still women think if I perform good yeah. Yeah. and well, yeah. then everybody will find me and I will get promoted. But that's not the case. Nope. Men talk about their successes mm -hmm. and we think we will be discovered, you know. So there is this <laughs> model, high. It's about performance, image and exposure. Yeah. And we women think if 70% of the success factor is performance, but it's not true. 70% of the su success factor is exposure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, well, performance only 10%. Mm. So um, it's very important that we keep that in mind Being and that again. what you say and what unfortunately happens and when we come back to balancing, you know, private and professional life, what we also see is, you know, the, 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 the really important talk is being done afterwards mm -hmm. at the networking events, yep. at the operas. That's when women go home and pick up the kids from daycare. Yes. And yes. that's why I like or when you... Or they send their husbands well, you know home. What? No, exactly, <laughs> but that's what they should do, right? Yeah. That's why I liked what you said. You really have to talk, you have to make your partner a real partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And women will Quoting not do Cheryl that Sanford. tonight because we are going to have a cocktail <laughs> because it's <laughs> half past five and it's about time to have it already. Mm -hmm. I know it, oh. it was so interesting we didn't see the time turn. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's a great opportunity for you and all of us to to do that network. I want to thank you so much, each of you. Uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was really great, um, yeah. great insights. Thank you for your questions. I hope uh, you've uh, had a good time. Uh, thank you very much, Alexandre. Thank you for the animation. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure and an honor. Well done, everybody. Well done. So, as I said, there's a drink uh, for you just where we were before. <laughs> that doesn't mean a gin tonic or oh, whatever. Damn. You can just have water <laughs> too, but... <laughs> and I'm just going to ask uh, our guest stars to stay here because we've just got a photograph. I think the uh, CSM would like to with Pia on the screen. Uh, thank you, Pia. Will you just stay with us a few, uh, just a moment? Sure. For the photograph. Okay, thank yes. you ever so much. I will meet you just uh, later on. Diamonds glassy. 